last time we talked about uh, scalars or one-dimensional vectors, if you want to be esoteric about it, uh, numbers, basically. We were talking about the number line, um, how you got numbers from, you know, you have zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then up, and then negative one, negative two, and so forth up to positive infinity, negative infinity. So this is kind of the conceptual number line, right? Um, then we extended that to two dimensions. So we take that number line and then we kind of like flip it. So now we have two axes. Uh, so now we have two dimensions along which we have some coordinates. Uh, so this allows us to have two dimensional vectors. And vectors are incredibly fundamental because it's what we use for almost everything, it feels like. Like we use it for space transformation, uh, we use it for the velocities, for positions, for orientations, like we use it for so many different things. Uh, so it's incredibly fundamental to like have a good grasp of vectors. Um, then we talked about the dot products. So maybe it's good to do like a very quick refresher on the dot products. Uh, so the dot product is an operation between two vectors. So if we have one vector, A, and we have another vector, actually let's do a longer one. B. Um, if A is normalized, as in it has a length of one, right, and this could be any length, then the dot product between these two um, is the projection onto kind of the infinite line created by A here, right? Um, yeah, so the dot product gives us the um, this distance here. So this is dot a b. Uh, so it doesn't actually give us a vector. Uh, it doesn't give us like it doesn't give us the the whole vector going from from here to here. Um, all it gives us is a scalar value for the length of this one. Um, now it's not exactly the length uh, because the length is pretty much always. Um, the, the, the length is pretty much always positive, like in standard context, length is always positive, distance is always positive, uh, speed is always positive, uh, but in some cases it might be useful to talk about negative distances. Um, so usually when you have these like weird negative things that shouldn't be negative, you call it signed distance or signed speed uh, or signed area and so forth. So if you flip B to the other side, uh, then the projection here is going to be negative instead of positive, right? Uh, so someone asked if dot AB and dot BA is different. Uh, no, you, they give you the same result. It doesn't matter what order you do them in. Uh, the geometric interpretation of the projecting onto the other vector um, only holds if one of them is normalized. At least one of them has to be normalized for this geometric relationship to be true. So if, whenever you do some sort of projection, uh, then pretty much always you want to make sure that one of them is normalized so that you can have the actual distance here. Uh, in some cases, you don't actually want to have it normalized. Um, the effect of not having this normalized is that, say, say it's twice as long. Let's say A has a length of two. Then what's going to happen is that this distance is going to be twice as long. Uh, so then it's no longer a projection like this, you know, then it's going to be something that it goes, goes twice as far away, right? So, so then you're going to get this distance. That is a very beautiful, very beautiful line. There you go. <laughs> that distance. Um, however you want to interpret my scribbles. Um, but yeah, basically that's what would happen. Uh, is there a geometric re representation of the tip of tip of A being projected onto B. Um, not really. Uh, the problem is that uh, it's sort of like a projection, but then scaled by the magnitude of this one, uh, as in the length of B. Um, so, so it doesn't really make sense. Um, you would get a vector that sort of goes here, right? Because that would be the, the same length as this, or not a vector, sorry, the magnitude here. Um, the same thing as the magnitude here. Um, but swapping A and B, you get the same results. It doesn't matter uh, what order you do them in. Uh, but the crucial part is that uh, one of them has to be normalized for the 90 degree right angle projection to make sense, right? But that being said, there are, there are a lot of cases where you uh, don't use a normalized um, vector here. Um, but for most cases, uh, you would have either one of them be normalized or both of them be normalized. 
Uh, if you use it graphically, it makes it easier if you project the long one onto the normalized one. If both are normalized, it doesn't matter. If both are normalized, both directions uh, give you the, the exact same... Uh, well, it's the same result, but the geometric interpretation works both ways, right? Now I'm very self-conscious about saying right too often. Thanks, students. Jeez. Good thing I'm not grading your assignments. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so if we have two vectors, we have A, we have B. In this case, both of them are normalized. They have a length of one. If you do this, then we can think about what it means to project each onto the other, right? So we take this one, we can project it there, and then the dot product gives us this um, distance, right? If we project this one onto the other one, we get the same distance here. So it doesn't matter if um, if both of them are normalized. Like in that case, like the geometric interpretation works both ways. But regardless of the interpretation or the visuals, um, projecting or like swapping the order of the, the arguments of the dot product doesn't matter. It gives you the same results. Uh, so that was a short recap on the dot product. Uh, it's very important and good to know because like as soon as you know how the dot product works, you can sort of work out a lot of the formulas that you otherwise would have to Google for. Like if you're like, oh, how do I uh, project something onto a plane or whatever. But if you know the how the dot product works, you can kind of work that out yourself. And the more you do that type of math, uh, the more intuitive Intuitive, it's going to become after a while and you're just going to be way more efficient every time you do some gameplay code that involves like space, positions, directions, and so forth, right? Uh, so that's the dot products. We also talked a lot about vectors in general, like how they work, how they um, add together, and so forth. Uh, I don't think I would need to repeat much of that, so I think I'm going to skip to the uh, assignments. The first assignment was to create the radial trigger that we created um, earlier, right? When we were talking about uh, how do you make a trigger where you're inside or outside and so forth. So all we need to figure out is, is this point inside a trigger of a given radius that is at some position in the world, right? So uh, I guess we can just start by making a component for this radial trigger. All right. We don't need those. We're just going to do everything in Andra Gizmo so we don't have to press the play button because that's gross. Uh, okay, we're going to need to use Unity um, Editor Andra Gizmo. So first thing, whenever I want to do some sort of like in editor thing where maybe you have a level with a bunch of enemies or some objects where you want to be able to see the you want to be able to see the radius of whatever it is you're doing so so kind of like the the first thing that i want to do is to make sure that i can kind of set up all the parameters in order to test my math right if i don't have all the parameters there if i don't have the visualization uh, it gets difficult to test and you kind of like blindly write a bunch of code and then if it ends up not working you don't have any way of like verifying it and you have to like start again and like try to do all of the like visualization afterwards when you don't even know what's wrong. So usually I like just setting everything up so that you have all the parameters ready. Um, so in our case, we, we, we just have one parameter, right? It's the radius. And we want to be able to draw this radius so that we can see what the radius is of this trigger. There are various gizmo drawing functions. There's gizmos dot draw sphere, wire sphere, cube, and so forth. There's also handles dot draw. Um, handles is in the Unity Editor namespace, so usually you would have to um, compile that out. Because if you're making builds, uh, this would just not compile. It would scream at you and be like, hey, handles is not included in builds. All right, so we need to draw the radius of this object. Uh, so we can do handles dot, uh, I think it's wire disk. Uh, we have center, normal, and radius. The center is going to be the position of this object, right? Uh, we're going to need to use these variables later. So I'm just going to set up some variables. So we have the uh, center, and that's going to be the, the position of this transform. Yeah, so so yeah, that's the only one we need so far. So we can do center. Then we need the normal. Um, that That's going to be the normal of the plane in which the disk resides. Uh, which is a little esoteric right now because we haven't talked about 3D vectors yet. Uh, but but again, the, the normal of a surface is a 
uh, vector pointing directly outwards from that surface. So the blue arrow in this case is the normal of my hand, right? And my hand can sort of define a plane. It's a, it's a planar surface. And specifying the normal tells Unity what orientation the disk should have. We've given it the position, but not the orientation. So the orientation is given by passing in this vector, and that makes the disk go in around that axis, sort of. And it's going to be on the um, XY plane instead of the Z plane or whatever, um, because we're just doing 2D right now. Uh, so all we need to pass into this one um, is a vector that is pointing into the depth direction. And you can do that either using uh, vector 3 forward, which uh, vector 3 forward is exactly the same thing as new vector 3, 0, 0, 1. Uh, right, and then we have the radius. So the radius, we already have that as a parameter. Cool. Then we, let's just verify that this works. What a circle. And then we can change the radius. Um, oh, random useful unity tip. Uh, when tweaking parameters, when you click and drag the title of the, the parameter, uh, if you hold shift, you will increase it faster. If you hold alt, it will be uh, slower and or like increase with, with less of a step every time you drag the, the mouse. So if you hold alt, you can make like finer adjustments than uh, when you when you aren't holding it. All right, so we have have that set up now. We can set up the radius. It's drawn at the position of the trigger and all of that, right? So now, now we're good. Now we can start doing the actual math in this. Um, <clears throat> oh, actually, we can't do the actual math because we don't have a point to test with. Uh, so let's set up a transform that we can use as our uh, test point. Point TF. Are handles less or more performant than gizmos? Um, I think it depends on the handle. Handles have a lot, of, lot more like advanced utilities uh, because the the handles have a lot of interaction stuff like click and drag and whatnot. Handles are kind of mostly supposed to be used for um, editor plugins rather than rather than just using them in like Andro Gizmos. So it's a bit of a weird way of using them. Um, but yeah, I think handles could be more expensive in some cases. Gizmos probably more expensive than others. I, I'm not entirely sure. But that being said, they aren't free. So if you're working on a very big game, it can be very useful to make sure that they're only visible when you have things selected. Uh, so on draw gizmo selected um, is a function you can use to make sure that it's only drawn if we select this trigger, right? So now it's invisible unless it's selected. Uh, so, so there has been issues where uh, when we were working at my studio, we were making a game called Budget Cuts, and it was kind of this huge game for a very small team. And when we ended up with these like very large levels, we had a lot of objects you can interact with. We were showcasing like, we were displaying the radius of interaction, radii of stuff. Uh, we had like boxes to mark things and triggers. And like after a while, you have so many gizmos that your editor is actually tanking in performance uh, because you, you're visualizing too much, right? Uh, so, so it's not free. And in some cases, it's like, you do need to make sure that you don't always draw the gizmos. You can of course always toggle them in the viewport as well. Um, you can turn off what gizmos you want to see here like per component um, if you want to. Um, but yeah, but that also collapses the components. It's a little annoying. Um, but anyway, something to keep in mind. Uh, let's give this uh, some sort of label. Let's call it radial trigger. Is there any way to change the thickness of a gizmo um, and making it look good? No, not really. For that you would need a vector graphics library um, but, um, but yeah, no, that there, like, there is a handle saw draw line, and I do believe that one has a thickness, but I don't think it looks good. Um, yeah, I forget. Maybe it's the polyline that has thickness. Yeah, this one has a width. If you supply a texture, you can also supply width here. Um, but it's probably not going to look very good. Okay. Also, thanks, Thor. Thor was plugging shapes. <laughs> Now we need a point to test with uh, some dummy object that we're going to pretend is the, um, you know, a player or some object where we want to activate this trigger, right? So let's call it uh, the object. It's a great name for an object. And then we should give it an icon. So the, again, the first assignment, we just need to detect, are we inside or outside of this trigger? That's what we're going to do. So we have the transform of the points. Uh, so let's let's make an object position. 
dot position. So now we have the center of the trigger, we have the object position, and we have the radius. All we need now is the math to do this. Uh, we're probably also going to want to like visualize this somehow so we can tell whether or not it's working. Um, so an easy way of doing it is just coloring the handles based on uh, whether or not you're inside, right? So let's let's make a bool. Let's call it uh, is inside. Uh, let's set it to the false for now until we do the math. And let's do handles dot uh, color equals is inside. If it's inside, we want to do color dot green. And otherwise, we want to do color dot red. So now we're going to be able to see this. Okay. So now we have all the parameters. Now we can visualize this. And now we just need to do the math. So now that we have these two points, um, one thing to always remember whenever you're dealing with vectors or positions or any any vector two types or vector three types, keep in mind like what vectors are and what their data represents. Uh, the position of these two, if you draw them as vectors, they would be arrows going from the origin of the world to that position uh, for both of these, right? So what we don't want the the like distance to the origin or anything like that, right? We want the distance between these two points in order to figure out how close the player is, right? Let's do that. So we first first need that distance. So float, uh, not pistons, uh, distance vector two dot distance between the center of the trigger and the object position. Now we have that distance. After that, we can then check, are we closer or further away than the radius of the trigger? So, so essentially, we are inside if the distance is less than or equal to the radius. And that's kind of it. That's, that's enough to, to do this little, little simple trigger script. Um, and then null reference exceptions are also, also part of this experience. Uh, so now we can see that it works. Uh, we should also make sure that we can change the radius and it should still work predictably when changing that. And it seems to do. Um, yeah. This vector two, vector three distance well optimized. I mean, you can't really optimize it further if you actually want the accurate distance. Um, well, you could optimize it further by not using functions. Uh, quite often, if you if you if you're in a very very like micro optimization situation sometimes writing out the math yourself using floating point values instead of like calling functions and whatnot sometimes you can get a performance gain out of that uh, but generally don't don't think about that until you have to right because it makes your code like almost unreadable and cluttered and annoying to work with right i wouldn't care about that until you have to but yeah usually if you have like a for loop of like iterating over thousands of objects in an update loop or whatever. That's when you kind of, that's when you need to start thinking about this type of stuff. Uh, but otherwise I would just optimize when you need to. All right, should we do the, the second one? Let's make a new script. Uh, what do we call this one? Um, this was a look trigger. Androgismos. So for this one, uh, we wanted to have a trigger that should should be able to activate when you are looking at it, right? Where you have a player that is looking in some direction, and then you have the location of the trigger. And if the player is close enough to looking toward it, we want it to activate. And if it's looking too far away, we want it to deactivate. Uh, there should also be a threshold, so you can tweak kind of like how how accurate you need to be. Do you need to look exactly at it? Or is there some margin of error there where you can look slightly to the sides if you need to? Um, usually, if you were to have that situation of requiring you to look exactly at the object, then it would be useless because floating point precision kind of dictates that you're pretty much never going to have an exact vector pointing towards an object. Because uh, it's very hard to look at a point. But if you look at something that has a bigger radius or something that has a bit of a margin of error, it's easier. Uh, and you can sort of imagine this being useful for stuff like uh, maybe you have a horror game and you want to make something happen if the player looks at the spooky ceiling panel in this house or whatever, then you want something to happen. Well, it's like simple use case for um, how to 
um, how you could use something like this. So let's set up that threshold. So let's have a um, uh, let's have a threshold called strictness or something. I don't know. Um, I don't know what we should call it, but it should go from zero to one. Um, preciseness. I don't know. Um, maybe field of view radius. Uh, no, because this doesn't work. Um, this one isn't actually using a radius and it's not actually angularly consistent. And we're going to get into that, but we haven't talked about angles yet. We're going to get into angles as soon as we get into trigonometry. Uh, so that's going to be later today. Okay, so we have our preciseness value. And now we just need to set up kind of the boilerplate just to, to get this up and running. Sort of like the same thing as last time. We need the, um, the uh, trigger position. So we're just going to call that center. And that's going to be transform.position. Uh, we're going to need a transform. And the object transform. Let's set up the object position. Okay. Let's set up the objects. Why did I call that zero? Is this a player or a trigger? Look trigger. Let's reuse the same object. Let's just have one, one object. We have our look trigger, the yellow one here, and we have our player. So whenever you need to solve a problem where it's a, like some geometric problem, it's a relationship between objects, yeah, positions and directions, uh, the, the first thing to solving a problem is always knowing what information you have and what information you need to figure out. So right now, we don't actually have all information yet. We have the positions of these two, but we also need the direction that the player is looking, right? And currently, the we, we don't really have that. We don't have that in code, and we're not visualizing it here. So the first thing I would do is to visualize the direction that the player is looking. Also, we could also draw um, draw a line between the the two just for visualization purposes. So, um, so draw a line from center to object position. Also, we should probably make sure that we have. Um, reset the color. So uh, if we want to draw the, the direction that the player is looking, first we need to decide, uh, how do we decide like what direction the player is looking? Well, a very useful way of doing it is using the, um, using the transform of this object, because we can rotate this one in Unity, and we can see that we have the, the transform has axes in and of itself, right? So we can, let, let's just say the x-axis is the direction that the player is looking. I think by convention, if you're making a 2D game, the x-axis is usually the reference vector. And if you're making a 3D game, the z-axis is usually the reference vector for uh, look directions. So it kind of depends on how you've set things up. Uh, but so, so I'm going to use the x-axis in this case. All right, so let's draw the x-axis. Let's, let's actually make it a red, because the x-axis is red. And then do gizmos dot draw line and now we need to, again, now we're visualizing something that is a pure direction uh, and things that are just directions don't have positions, right? It, it's just the direction. So, so in this case, uh, we need to be careful about like if we're drawing a line, uh, where are we drawing it, right? In this case, we need two endpoints. If we're using draw line, we could also use draw ray, but I don't like draw ray, so I never use it because I like explicitly stating things. So. We need to, we want to draw the x-axis, but we want to draw it at the player, right? So we're going to do this at the object position. Should I rename this to player position, maybe? Let's do that. So we have the player position, and then we want to draw it at the player position again, plus the that vector, right? Let's, let's define that vector. Player 
look direction equals the uh, object transform dot right. So right is the x axis, and um, up is the y axis. Forward is the z axis. Uh, so we draw a line from the player to the player plus the look direction. So what that means is that there's going to be a line that goes one meter out from the player. There we go. So now if we rotate this one, we have a red line that is now um, directly aligning with the x-axis of the player. OK. So now the next thing we need to do is how to, like, now we need to figure out how to check if you're looking towards something or away from something. And this is something we talked about yesterday. Uh, it's one of the ways we can use the uh, dot product. Remember how we talked about if you have two normalized vectors, then doing the dot product between those two uh, can sort of tell you how close they are to being similar versus looking directly away from each other. Uh, so if you have the red vector a here, and then you do the dot product between uh, a and something that is like exactly at the same position, the dot product um, is going to be one. I don't know why there's a big zero there. That's confusing. I think I just drew a circle. That's on a different layer. Let's just ignore that big zero. Look at the one here. <laughs> okay, so the dot product between a and the vector that's equivalent uh, will just be one. As soon as you start uh, giving it a vector that's rotating away from it, uh, the value is going to decrease. Um, so you would get a value of 0.8 here and so forth. Um, until you hit exactly perpendicular, uh, when you are perpendicular, it's going to be exactly zero. Um, and it doesn't matter what direction you do this in. It's the same thing in this direction too. It's also zero if it's perpendicular in any direction. And then you can continue this. If you um, keep moving this vector over here, you're going to start getting negative values until they're exactly opposite. That's when you're going to get a negative one. Again, this is if you are doing this with normalized vectors. Um, not all of these numbers would match if they're not normalized, uh, but regardless of if they're normalized or not, the perpendicular case is always zero, no matter how long or short they are. So that's really useful to remember, because sometimes it's a bit of an optimization. Sometimes you can save a few cycles by not normalizing the vectors. If the only thing you want to know uh, is if it's pointing sort of in the same direction or sort of away from uh, some other vector. In that case, don't bother normalizing. Unless they're like extreme, in which case you might get weird floating point precision issues in the uh, at the border, but usually it's fine. So, so this is useful now because we want a look trigger where if the player is here and they are looking toward the trigger, then we want it to activate. If they're looking away from the trigger, we want it to deactivate. So that's what we're going to use. We just need to use the dot products. Okay. So let's, let's set up a float. Um, I don't really know what this is uh, should be called. There's not really a good term for this because technically it's not how close you are looking at it in terms of angles. This is sort of just a weird projection thing, but it still works for our purpose purposes. Uh, so I'm just going to call it lookness or something like that. It kind of describes what it is and I like using silly names. It makes me happy. Uh, so I'm just going to call it lookness. Uh, how much we're looking toward this one, right? Um, one thing that's important whenever you do these types of variables, um, if this is called lookness, then the higher this value is, the more look you have, right? Uh, so make sure that the direction of this um, is correct. O otherwise, it would be look awayness in case like uh, one is looking away and zero is looking directly at it, right? Um, so that's something that's a good thing to keep in mind to make sure that your variables are like. Um, kind of consistent in, in terms of the, the direction that they're sort of hinting at. All right, so now we have lookness. Um, so how do we figure out the lookness between these vectors? Well, we have the direction that the player is looking. Uh, we don't have the direction to the look trigger. Thor. Buddy. OK. <laughs> we don't have the direction to the look trigger. We, we're just drawing a line between them. So let's get that direction. Um, so we're not quite ready with, for, to do the lookness yet. 
So we can call this uh, player to trigger direction. Yeah, so all we need to do is we um, we use the, the position of the trigger and then we subtract the player position. And the way that I think about this is sort of like, it kind of looks like this should be center to player, but it's always reversed. So keep that in mind. In this case, it's player to center, um, which is a little frustrating, but that's the way it is. And we need to make sure to normalize this. If we don't normalize this, then the threshold is going to be different depending on how close or far away we are. Uh, in some cases, that might be behavior you want. Now that I think about it, this might actually simulate having a radius of the object, um, but I'm not sure. I would need to do the math to, to double check. Anyway, but in this case, for, the, for our purposes, um, let's just normalize this. Uh, so now we have the direction from the player to the trigger. And let's draw that one too. So let's draw, let's replace the old line. Let's draw it from the player to the player plus uh, player to trigger direction. So now we're visualizing uh, the two directions we have. There we go. All right, we need to, I kind of want to change color of this one because uh, it might be useful to, to keep red and green for the state of the trigger, like whether or not you're looking at it. All right, the x-axis is yellow now. Forget everything I said about the x-axis being red. Okay, so now we have the direction from the player to the look trigger, and we have the direction that the player is looking. So now we can use these two vectors to figure out how close they are to each other, right? If you look at these two vectors, we have exactly the same case uh, that we had here, right? We have two directions. We need to check how similar they are. And the dot product is a very cheap way of checking if two vectors are close to each other in terms of direction. And again, it's not linear in terms of angle, the way that we're checking this, uh, which is important to know. Uh, but in, in many cases, when you're just doing a threshold, it doesn't matter. Um, just like when you're checking distance, it doesn't have to be perfectly linear if you're just checking a distance threshold, if you're less than or, or, or greater than something. So it's kind of a similar case with the dot product here. We don't need to check the exact angles. It actually doesn't matter. All we need to know is if we're within or outside of some threshold. Okay, so we have our look trigger, we have the, the direction of the player, and now we need to do the dot product. <clears throat> so vector2 dot dot player2 trigger direction and the uh, player look direction. Cool. Now we have the lookness. But what do we do with this? Well, we need to use our threshold, right, for the, the preciseness of this. <clears throat> um, and again, silly names. Uh, if this is called preciseness, that should mean if this value is higher, it's more precise. If it's lower, it's less precise. Uh, so try to be consistent again with the directions of your naming. Uh, let's use preciseness as our threshold. So um, that would be a bool again. Um, is looking at, at it, I don't know. <clears throat> or just is looking. So all we need to check is if lookness is um, greater than or equal to preciseness. Um, and that should be it. So now let's color this one based on is looking. There we go. So now we can rotate this one and we can see that we are getting a green line when we're looking at it and a red line when we're looking away. Uh, let's test the threshold. Let's make it very precise. We're going to set this to 0.98. So now it shouldn't go green until we're very close towards looking at it. There we go. We can do it even more. 999. Dude. So now it's like way more precise. Now you have to look almost directly at it, right? And if we set the preciseness to zero, then we only have to be, um, the, the angle between here only has to be less than 90 degrees. That's the only requirement. But if we go outside, that's when it goes red. So now we've made a, a, very, a very simple little look trigger. Um, and one way of like thinking about this is that this could also be used for stuff like if you have a stealth game or something and you have like your enemies have view cones 
then you could use exactly this type of system uh, where the preciseness would define kind of how wide the view cone is. And then you can use that to see whether or not they would see a player given uh, the direction to the player and the direction that some character is looking, right? Um, yeah, was that clear? Any questions about that? Would shapes be useful to make those view cones? Yes. <laughs> Can you also do this in 3D space? Yes, the dot product works in any number of dimensions. Um, the, uh, the difference it would make in 3D uh, is that instead of a simple cone like this that goes toward infinity, uh, it would be a three-dimensional cone, right? Instead of a two-dimensional like wedge like this. Uh, but yes, it would still work. And I don't know how to draw. There we go. I'm still working on my drawing skills. There we go. So in 3D, it would it would work just the same way. It would also work in 4D. Uh, can you make this code to look inside a circle radius? I think that would be something that we can talk about after we talked about trigonometry. Wouldn't that just be adding a distance check? Uh, no, it wouldn't. I'm pretty sure the the math might simplify to it, uh, but that's not how I I would initially uh, do it. Freaking floats. My lookness is negative. Um, it could be that you you got the direction flipped. Um, if the, the player to trigger direction, if you did this the other way around, uh, then it would be negative. When I look away at screen, I could just flip the colors, I guess. Well, it's probably good to make sure that the variables you have actually represent the things that they say they do, right? Um, so finding where things are wrong is usually pretty important in case people want to reuse any of these variables. Uh, but if you did any of them wrong, just flipping the color or the result is going to make these variables misleading, right? Does not work with three ve three vectors. Does plus work for three scalars? Um, well, they're not analogous. Um, so even though, like you say, the dot is a two operand operator, um, the dot takes two vectors, but it returns a scalar. It doesn't actually return a vector. So you can't just do the dot product between something and then use that as one of the parameters for a second dot product, right? Um, so you would need to interpret it some way that it's not just a pure dot product. I mean, you could kind of look at the definition of a dot product and just shove in one more argument there for one more vector. Uh, but then the question is like, yes, you you can do it mathematically, but what does it mean? Like, what does that give us? Is there some interpretation of that that's useful? And as far as I know, there's not, uh, but I could be wrong. Um, how would you translate it to using an angle instead of a preciseness value? We're going to get into that as soon as we get into trigonometry. Uh, trigonometry is going to be, um, next up, we're going to talk about space, like space transformation and matrices. And after that, we're going to get into trigonometry and angles. So uh, we're going to we're going to return to this issue or this this problem at some point um, once we're talking about angles. A data structure is used in games a lot. Stake linked list? I don't know what the, the stake thing is, um, but linked lists, yeah, they're used a lot. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on what you're doing and what data structures you're talking about. Um, yeah, linked lists are used a lot. Arrays are used a lot. Uh, tree structures are used a lot, especially in like spatial optimization for like octrees, trees, um, KD trees, and that type of stuff. Um, yeah, lots of data structures. Oh, stacks. Um, yeah, I mean you could have a uh, you could have stacks as well. Uh, one example of something that I did was so so in my game that I'm working on, I have a level editor, uh, and in my level editor, you can you can place objects. You can manipulate objects. They're kind of like Bezier curves that you can manipulate. Uh, and for every action you do, I want to be able to undo, right? So what that means is that every time I do an action, let's say I move this there, then uh, I basically have two stacks. There's the undo stack and the redo stack. So if I move an object, this action is going to get recorded on the undo stack. So now we're going to place that action there. And we can move another object that's going to place one more action on the undo stack and so forth. The more things we do, the more things get added to the undo stack. When you press undo, what happens is that we pop this off of the undo stack and we place it in the redo stack. Uh, so that is going to move into the redo stack. Um, if we If we keep undoing, it's all going to be popped over to the redo stack. Uh, if we redo, the other way around happens. We uh, move it back from the redo stack to the undo stack. Um, so, so I've used that for my undo system in, uh, in my game.
Um, so, so yeah, stacks can be useful in some cases. I don't use stacks very often. This is kind of a, more of an exception, uh, but it was really useful for, for this type of system. Uh, does Andro Gizmos update when you move objects? I'm trying to use if statements operator and it doesn't update. Um, Andro Gizmos is called um, every time the editor is updated or every time any of the values of your object changes. I think it's like, um, Andra Gizmos happens every time the scene view has to repaint, and there are like there are different cases where the scene view needs to repaint, uh, as in re-render everything that you can see. But generally, Andra Gizmos sort of kind of function like an update loop, um, except it doesn't it doesn't update the rendering if it doesn't have to. Is the redo stack emptied as soon as you add something to the undo stack? Yes. Yeah, because technically the um, technically the the like undo, redo, action stuff you do. Um, it's kind of like you make an action, you, you do another action, and then you do another action. And then if you undo, you kind of jump back here, right? Uh, and then what happens is that this becomes part of the redo stack, right? Uh, but if you then do another action, um, technically, if you want to be like neat about it, you would kind of branch off and you would create another um, undo operation here, you do another operation and so forth. Um, so like you could theoretically make a tree structure out of this, uh, but generally there's the whole like UI side of things of like, how do you even navigate this tree, <laughs> right? It's a very esoteric system. And like explaining this to users is kind of complicated. Like, because if you then undo this again, let's say you undo these actions and then now you want to do some other actions, then what's going to happen is that uh, you have not, you now have three branches here. Um, and let's say you want to undo back here, like what does that process even look like, right? Uh, because you need to have some way of after you've undone this one to go either of these three paths, but you only have one hotkey for redoing. And then it's like, oh, when you press redo, do, should you like get this tree on screen and you can click the one you want to go down? Like generally this is like very over-engineered and most people are not going to need it um, just for like those few cases where you're like, oh, God damn it, I made an action. I can't redo the things anymore. Um, usually it's not worth it in terms of like um, workload and trade-offs in, um, in design, right? All right, I think we're ready to move on then. So now we're going to talk about another very important, um, very important concept when you're making games. So we've talked about the, uh, the number line, right? Uh, you have the, um, kind of the X axis and you have the Y axis. And usually, uh, when you're looking at objects in unity, uh, all you're seeing is like these two arrows, right? You don't actually see the infinite lines, like spanning all of the observable universe. You just see these arrows, right? Um, and it's the, the arrows you have when you select an object. And what these arrows are showing, at least when your gizmo is set to local and your location is set to pivot, uh, what these are showing is the position and the, uh, the space of this object. Uh, so if something is a child object of this one and it's moving along the x-axis, it's going to move along this red arrow, right? So what these two vectors are usually called uh, is that they're called basis vectors. And basis vectors, generally, not always, uh, have a length of one. So these arrows kind of point to um, the very first number in the number line. Uh, and obviously, this would continue to two and three and so forth, right? But as a shorthand for displaying coordinate systems, uh, we can use these arrows in order to like think about different spaces. The default space whenever you're working in games is, is called world space, generally, depending on in what context you are. If you are drawing the rendering and in shaders, um, arguably clip space is default, but we're not talking about shaders and rendering. Um, so if you're working in a scene in Unity, the default space for everything is the world space, right? And world space is located at zero, zero, zero in the world. And the axes are aligned with um, everything you see up here, right? The top right has the 
uh, is showing you the orientation of world space and world space origin is always at zero in, in the world, right? Uh, I had the wrong object selected. So we can just, there we go. So, so these axes are now aligned with the world space axes. Okay, but we're, we, for now, we can just think about uh, 2D. We don't actually need to go 3D yet. Okay, so now we have these basis vectors here. Uh, in Unity, they're scaling when you get closer or further away. Um, but the space itself, the basis vectors of the space, space doesn't like care about how close you are in terms of camera distance, right? Um, so these just scale for convenience. Uh, but in actuality, the coordinate system has these um, has these vectors kind of inherently in the way that the system is set up. So let's say we now have this uh, world space. Actually, let's not erase this just yet. Um, maybe we can maybe we can be sneaky about this. And then if we want to, for completeness, we can we can add the the z axis here to kind of visualize the fact that generally in Unity you would have three axes and not just two. But right now we can just think about two axes. So now we have world space. That's great. World space is useful. We use that to position objects all, all over the world, right? But we don't only have world space. We also have the space of every single object in the world, right? Uh, so if we look at this object, um, I guess maybe we should uh, remove the look trigger thing. So if we look at this one, this one is a different uh, set of basis vectors. These are not pointing in the same direction. So this one kind of depends on the rotation of the objects and they're pointing in different directions. Uh, but if you make a child object to this one, um, let's make it um, blue. There we go. So if we make a child object and we set the position to 1, 1, or actually let's just use the x-axis for now. Um, so now this one is positioned at one on the X axis and that's it. And if we move the parent object, <clears throat> this child object stays at the exact same position in local space, but not in world space. So we can move this one, we can rotate this one. Um, and the child object has the exact same local space coordinates all the time. It doesn't matter uh, where this one is, but the local space coordinates is just consistent. Um, it does move in the world, but not in local space. So what we've essentially created, uh, or what essentially <clears throat> every transform, every object has a space. And again, space is kind of just an interpretation of how we think about positions and <clears throat> and uh, orientations and whatnot, right? So, so quite often when you're working in games, when you're doing math and you're doing like trying to figure out how close two things are to each other, a really important thing is always figure out what space is this coordinate in. That is super crucial. And some of the most confusing bugs come out of using the wrong space, especially when you're dealing with rotations and angles. Um, so, so like if you use the coordinates here of, you know, this blue dot has an X coordinate of one and a Y and Z coordinate of zero, then that does not correspond at all to its world space location. Uh, the world space location is like something completely different. So you need to keep that in mind. It's, it's really important to, to always consider what space is this vector in? What space is this point in? What space is this direction in? And so forth. Uh, so that's important. So spaces, um, another way of thinking about these spaces is that we can essentially just take the existing the coordinate system and we can just put it somewhere else uh, with a different orientation, right? Uh, so now we have another coordinate system up here. So whenever you're thinking about this, if you have a position, let's say this one, if someone asks, where is this point? Like, where is this blue point? Um, it's kind of an ill post question. It, it's kind of like, well, where in terms of what? Like relative to what space? Um, if we're talking about local space, then we'd be talking about this vector right here. In local space, it would have an X coordinate of two and a Y coordinate of one. But in world space, it's entirely different. It's this vector going all the way from here. Also, that's kind of confusing. Should probably offset this a little bit. Um, 
in world space, it would go all the way from the origin of the world all the way up to that point. Um, so that's the world space position of that object. And that world space position is definitely not one, two. Uh, that is rather uh, like three and uh, four point something, right? So it's really important to know whatever, like, it's really important to know what space you're in. Um, and if you're, you're ever mixing up local space and world space when you're doing um, vector math, you're going to get very weird results. Um, so be careful with this. And sometimes it's useful to say, <clears throat> you know, whether or not a point is relative to another point, um, if it's relative to another space, if it's in local space or world space and so forth. Let's say this is world space. Let's do another color. Okay, so we have world space and then this, um, different applications use different terminology for this. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, object space and local space inter used interchangeably. In some cases, they mean different things. Um, I think Maya has uh, world space and then this would be object space and local space would be the parent of this object space because sometimes you can have a hierarchy where you have like multiple child object anyway it doesn't matter in unity call it local space object space <clears throat> that's usually what you call it um so this would be the local space of some specific object right so far so good any questions about this uh because we really really need to like it's super important that you understand this before we move forward who defines the local space? Uh, local space is relative to every object. Um, every transform has their own uh, local space. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. So, so this is an object with an orientation um, and a position. And then um, that defines a space in which we can think about coordinates or place objects. You essentially just said an object's transform as the origin plus rotation. Uh, pretty much, yeah. It's just another coordinate system. Um, just like we have world space is axiomatically at some position. If we go over here, we can just kind of, if we work in this space, we can just ignore world space. Um, and then if all the coordinates are in local space, we can do everything in local space, right? Um, so, so this is something that is, um, so if you're, if you're working with shaders, for instance, um, then you kind of have multiple spaces applied in a row. Uh, it's a very strange hierarchy, um, but basically uh, you go from uh, model model space uh, to uh, view space to projection, and then eventually you. I forget if, if which one is clip space. I think this you can use these transformations to get a coordinate in clip space. Um, so like. And if you are doing things in shaders, then there are many spaces that you are juggling. Uh, and quite often, you can optimize things by like not using world space, for instance. Because um, in world space, sometimes you, you're doing like an unnecessary amount, amount of like transformations. Um, so, so it can be useful sometimes to just do everything in local space, and then you're kind of um, ignoring the world orientation or whatever, because because uh, sometimes you just need local space coordinates. And then at the very end of all of your calculations, that's when you can transform back to world space if you need it, right? So you had a, you got an assignment. Assignment number three is very related to the things we are talking about here. Uh, so the assignment was basically uh, write a function that can transform between world space and local space. Uh, that's essentially what assignment three was. And I did say that it was a bit of a curveball because we hadn't talked about spaces. Um, so I'd sort of hope that you would either look it up or have an intuitive understanding of it. Um, but, but yeah, anyway, so that was the thing that we were going to do. So let, let's do that. Let's just think about how we could approach this. Uh, let's erase this one first. Our old position is stored in world space internally, and then it's just local space converted when it's needed. Um, we're going to get into that later. Once we get to matrices, we were going to talk about that. Um, the internal storage is a little funky because they use matrices. Uh, so we're going to talk about that later. But in terms of like if the matrices themselves cache the hierarchy of transforms, I actually don't know. Um, 
I, I do remember that there is quite a bit of an overhead if you have very deep hierarchies of objects. Uh, so like sometimes um, a big optimization you can do, especially if you're animating objects in hierarchies, is to kind of like collapse hierarchies a lot. So I don't know if they cache matrices uh, in order to save performance, if that's what you were asking. OK, so the assignment you're given was um, make a function that can transform from local space to world space. In other words, if we have this vector, so this is the vector x component 2, y component 1. Uh, so we want to write a function that can take this coordinate, this local space coordinate, and convert that to this vector going all the way from world space to the same point, but we want to express that as a world space coordinate, which in this case would be like three and four point something. Okay, I did world to local. Uh, the assignment was to do both. So now we have um, now we have the problem that we need to solve, and like I mentioned before, we can look at. The, whenever you want to solve a problem, the first thing you need to look at is what information do you have uh, that you can use to solve this problem. So well, what do we have? Um, well, we, we have the position of this object. We just haven't drawn it, but we do have this position, which is this vector right here. Then we have the local space coordinates of this vector. So now we can try to figure out, OK, how do we get uh, this one in world space, uh, but we do have these two basis vectors, uh, like this one right here. This is transform dot up. Uh, this one right here. Transform dot right. So we have these vectors. They they exist, and that's information we can use in order to help us figure out how to get this point, but in world space. So remember that we have the local space position of this object. Uh, the local space position was the uh, two on the x-axis and one on the y-axis. So what we can do is that we can take this vector, transform dot right. And we can multiply it by the local space x coordinate. And what we're going to end up with is a vector going all the way to this 2 right here. And then we do the same thing for the y-axis. In this case, it's 1. Uh, so we're going to get a vector that's exactly the same as, as this one. And now that we have this long vector here, the kind of the scaled um, x-axis, and then we have the, the scaled y-axis, if we add these together, we're going to end up getting um, this blue vector in world space. So what this means is that all of a sudden, we, we have this vector, and then we have this vector too in world space. And then all we need to do is add those up. And adding those two together, um, just like we talked about before, vector addition, if you have two vectors and you want to add these together, uh, it's kind of like taking the moving one of the other to the tip of the other one, and then you get this diagonal across this one. Um, and that's what we're doing here. We literally have arrows one after the other in the same space. Again, that's important. Um, so, so using the basis vectors, we can convert from a local space position to a world space offset. Um, so that is a way we can get this vector right here. And then all we need to do is add the position of the object itself, which is this vector. Okay, let's do this in practice because we, we've done a lot of done a lot of theory. So, so let's, let's implement this. Presuming you want to see this implemented, I'm guessing it might be useful. Okay. Um, let's see. Maybe we can start out by visualizing the basis vectors. Uh, so, we're going to use this object itself as our as the the object that has the um, as this object. So the script resides on this one. So transform dot position would be this object or the, that position. Is it like getting the transforms to get the basis of the vector spaces? What if the thing you want is not an object? Um, 
What do you mean by, is it like getting the transforms? Um, what if the thing you want is not an object? Um, you can do this math without using a transform. Like these are pure vectors. If you already have these vectors defined in world space, um, you basically have a coordinate system ready to go, right? Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Why not use Pythagorean and get the vector in world space? Um, I'm not sure how that would help. We would get the length of the hypotenuse, which is not useful for this. I think you did answer your question. Okay, great. Yeah, let's just visualize the basis vectors and um, and so forth. Um, let's see. We're going to use functions now, but you know what functions are, so this is not a problem. <laughs> Um, let's use draw ray this time. Uh, position. Right. Color dot red. Um, up. Green. Now I have a very simple function just to draw the basis vectors or something. We might want to reset the color afterwards. Um, okay, now I have a simple function to draw the basis vectors or something. So let's draw the basis vectors of this object. So position would be transform dot position. Uh, then we have transform dot right, transform dot up. We might actually want to make variables out of this. Um, um, I guess we should do this one too. Uh, right. Cool. Okay, so what we have now is object position is the, the blue dot here. Uh, actually, maybe we should make this one blue just to match the diagram. Um, there we go. And then we have right and up. So right and up in this case are that that's the basis vectors of this transform. And when you do transform dot right and transform dot up, you get these directions in world space. Um, and again, whenever you have a vector, uh, where the base is not at zero, you can discard that. The The only thing that matters um, is the uh, data that underlies this one. Um, so we have just visualized this one at this location for convenience. Uh, but if we were to just draw the raw vector data, uh, we would have this direction down here, right? Uh, but we're just drawing it up here because it's easier to know what this direction actually represents, right? But it is in world space and that's important to know. Uh, local space of this one, um, that would be zero on the x-axis and one on the y-axis, because that's kind of axiomatically how, um, what those vectors would be in local space. Okay, so now we should be able to see basis vectors if I recompile. Uh, all right, so now we have a green line and a red line. So these are the basis vectors, and this time they actually have the correct length. They're supposed to be one unit in length. And so we can move this one around and change the, the orientation and so forth. Um, let's also, uh, let's also draw the, uh, world space because it might be useful to see where world space actually is, right? And world space, um, the draw functions always have things in world space. So we can just say, um, vector 2.0 because that's the origin of the world. Um, and we can do vector 2.write, not that one. Thanks, writer. And vector2 dot up. Oh, thanks autocomplete for messing up my code. Okay, so now we're drawing the basis vectors for world space too. So let's recompile. And so now we can see world space down there. All right. Neat. So now we need a points in local space. Um, let's see. Trying to figure out if we should just have a number input or if we should have an actual transform. It might be actually less confusing just to have a number input. 
Uh, or let's call this point. There we go. Local space point. So we're going to start by defining this in local space, just like we define this one as local space uh, coordinates 2 and 1, right? Uh, so we have the local space points, and it might be useful to, to draw this one. Uh, so let's do gizmos.drawsphere, and we're going to draw it um, at the local space point with some radius. And let's set color to color dot, uh, blue. Uh, that one is now at zero in world space, right? Um, right, we would actually kind of have to do the the math. And that's spoilers. I wonder if we should use the transform instead. Hmm. Hmm. No, actually, this is good. This is exactly what we want. Because um, in order to show this one at the lo correct location, we need to solve this problem, right? Uh, so now we have a, a coordinate, and this is supposed to be local space, um, but this one is now drawn at zero, and it's obviously drawn in, in world space because we haven't told it to draw anywhere else. Also, that blue is kind of gross. Let's use cyan instead. Uh, so how do we how do we transform this to local space? Because now um, now we just have this in world space. No, wait, actually, this is the other way around. Because now we need to transform from. Um, no, never mind. Sorry, I get this mixed up all the time. Uh, we're fine. We're good. <laughs> uh, so what we need is a local to world. We have a coordinate in local space, but we're drawing it in the completely wrong position. Uh, so so let's try to define that function. Um, the function is going to be uh, local to world. It's a very realistic process of trying to work with local and world space. Yeah, sometimes you just mix them up because like, especially when you're drawing them in the wrong space, it so easily trips you up. Um, so that's why I'm always like really careful about like, to be specific whenever you're working in local space or world space about like what space everything is in. Okay, so we have our local space point. It is currently drawing at the incorrect location. So if we set this to zero, it should draw here. If we set it to x1, it should draw here. If we set y to 1, it should draw here, right? But it's not. So we need to write this function. OK. Actually, let's just make a local function, because we have all the variables here. So how do we transform something from local to world? Uh, we have some, some points. And then we want to return a new point that's in world space. So this is what we talked about earlier. That's everything we went through here. So the first thing we want to be we want to want to get is this vector, the blue vector right here in world space. We have this vector in local space. Um, let's actually use the same data, uh, x2 and y1. So we have that in um, yeah. We, we want to get this vector right here. And like I mentioned before, the way you can do that is that you can use the basis vectors, as in this one, if you take the basis vector and multiply this by the local space x coordinate of the local space vector here, you will get the world space x axis offset. So that gives you this full length vector that goes all the way out to the tip of um, to the tip of this position in world space. And then through vector addition, we can do the same thing with the y axis, uh, and then we add these two vectors together. And what we're going to end up with uh, is this vector right here. Because vector addition is like taking this vector and putting it right here. Uh, or because doing a plus b is the same thing as b plus a, it's the same thing as taking this vector, adding it on top of here. And we end up at the same position. And the vector we get out of this is this blue one right here in world space. Yeah, so all we need then is uh, to get the, the blue one here. So let's call that the... Um, local world offset or something. Um, so this offset is now going to be the uh, basis vector on the x-axis. That's the red one right here. We multiply that by the local point um, x-coordinate. Uh, that's this one right here. And then we end up with this long vector. And then, again, we want to do the same thing, same thing for the y-axis. 
and then add them together. So we can just add the y-axis right after. Uh, so up multiplied by the local space point dot y, because now we want the y-axis. Uh, so now we have the blue vector in, um, in world space. Um, let's call it world offset. It's shorter. So now this represents this vector in world space, which is the space that we want to work with. But there's one more thing we need to do because, um, again, whenever we have a vector, uh, the vectors don't have a base and a tip. They just have the tip in terms of coordinates. Uh, so what this vector really is in world space right now um, is like this vector right here. Uh, so this position is incorrect. If we just use this value, um, it, it would just not work. I don't get how you can't just use local point directly. Um, when we, where do we draw it? If we just use local space point directly, which is what we're doing here, uh, it's going to draw this presuming that this point is in world space. Uh, but it's not, right? We want this to be a local space point. Uh, but Unity wants a world space point for their drawings, for, for all of their gizmo drawing functions. Uh, so what's going to happen is that it's going to interpret this coordinate as a world space coordinate, which it's doing, right? This coordinate right here is x2 and y1. So it's drawing this in world space, but we want this to be drawn here. And in order to do that, we need to convert our local space position here into world space because Unity's drawing functions wants world space. Um, did that make sense? Um, so, so basically it's interpreting our local space point as a world space point, which is incorrect. So we get, get incorrect values. So, so basically this is the same thing as we're just saying, uh, new vector two, uh, two, one. Like there, there, there's not really any way that the drawing function can know what space this is in. Uh, so it's just defaulting to world space, right? And that's something that's really important to, to remember as well. Um, vectors don't have the spaces. Uh, vectors are just numbers. Um, so if you have, like, it's kind of like saying five and you're like five, what? Like, is this a coordinate? Is this an amount of objects? Uh, is this, um, you know, it could be anything. So you have to be like clear about like what the actual coordinates mean and what context they're used in. Uh, okay, so that's why we need to write this local to world function because this is being interpreted as a world coordinate. So we need to convert our local coordinate to world space. Uh, okay, so the world offset here, we have now calculated um, this blue arrow in world space, but that again is just this vector. Um, so we need to do something else. We need to add this vector. And this vector right here is the world space position of the object. Uh, so all we need to do is do world space position plus this offset vector. Um, so we can do return uh, transform dot position plus world offset. Uh, and transform dot position is a vector three. So it's a little side right now. There we go. So now we have a function where we can um, where we can convert from local space to world space. So let's see if this works. Let's take the um, here. So uh, we want to get the world space point after this. Um, so let's define a variable. So point world space. So we do local to world and then we take our local coordinate, local space point. Let's be consistent, world space point. Now we have the world space position. Now we're going to pass that into the drawing function. Then when we go back, now it's drawing in the correct location. So if we rotate this one, it's now correctly positioned because we've converted this to world space so that the drawing function knows where to draw this thing, right? And we can change this local space point here if we want. We've set um, x to 1 and y to 0. Um, it's going to be sitting here, exactly like a child object would do if we had it as a child object, uh, like a transform child object to this object, right? Did that make sense? It gets a little complicated when you need to think about like coordinate spaces like this, um, which I mean, as you noticed, I even messed this up. So um, but yeah, this is something that's like really good to practice and try to like figure out um, 
yeah, how it all works. Okay, we're also going to do the other way around. Now we just did um, local to world, but we're also going to do world to local. Were quaternions allowed for this? Because this seemed to work. Uh, nope, that's not allowed. Sorry, I forgot to specify that. I said you were not allowed to use the transformation functions. Um, the point of this exercise is to make sure you have an understanding of spaces and the dot product. Uh, so if you're using the quaternion or you're using the internal transformation functions, uh, then you're kind of like missing the point of the exercise. Um, so I want you to not use uh, the quaternion. I don't want you to use the internal transformation functions. I want you to like sort of um, get an understanding of how the dot product works, right? And also the vector math, right? Because the thing we did here was is kind of just pure vector math of just adding vectors and scaling vectors. In the assignment, you also mentioned taking rotation of the object into account. What does that mean in this case? Um, there is a naive version you can do where you, if you want to convert from local space to world space, you can just take one and subtract the other, and then you have converted it. But this only works if the two coordinate spaces have the exact same rotation. Um, so if these two are aligned, we can simplify our code. Uh, in that case, uh, we, we just need to subtract the position or add the position of this object in order to get the to convert from local space to world space. Um, so, so the reason we're doing the basis vector multiplied by the local coordinate and the other basis vector multiplied by the coordinate um, is because we need to make sure that we, we take rotation into account. Uh, if we don't do that, then it's a simple subtraction uh, or an addition in order to figure out local to world. Um, so that would make the, the exercise pointless and too easy. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's what I mean by taking rotation into account. Oh, someone was asking, what is control ID and handles functions? Uh, so handles are generally, quote unquote, supposed to be used for editor gizmos that you can click and drag. And handle ID is used for um, identification purposes. So if you want to like know which component you've currently selected, handle ID is going to be the thing that that returns. Or if you want to set the keyboard focus or the mouse focus to some control, um, then you would use that index. So it's kind of just a way of identifying uh, handles. And um, yeah, you could just do negative one if it's unused or whatever. It worked for every rotation around the Z axis. Okay, cool. Well, grats in that case. Um, yeah, I, it's a very confusing function, uh, but cool. I'm glad it works. I guess like uh, mathematically, I guess it boils down to the same operations, but math is really weird that way. If you like, we haven't talked about algebra like almost at all, um, but if you really know algebra very well, you can just shuffle things around and have like completely different interpretations of um, what is actually happening in order to solve some problem. Um, I personally, um, I'm not super good at algebra and I don't do it a lot. And I am very like, I'm very visually driven. Uh, so anything I can visualize, I makes me happy. But a lot of algebra is very abstract and hard to visualize. Uh, so I usually don't like, uh, like when I write code, I write it in a way that makes sense geometrically in my head. All you did is algebra, vectors are an algebraic concept. Okay, what I mean when I say doing algebra is that you are you have an equation and you're shuffling things around using the algebraic rules and whatnot. We haven't done that like at all, or at least not explicitly. So that's what I mean. Okay, new question is how do we visualize this? Um, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna make a child object and we're gonna set the child object's local space position. That's how we're going to visualize this. Because then Unity is going to do a lot of the math for us that we haven't gone into yet. Okay. Let's see. So now we want to specify a world space coordinate. So, whoops. Uh, so we want to have a world space point. And then we want to convert that into a local space point, right? Um, oh, we also need the, the transform. There we go. Uh, we might want to draw the world space points. 
And now we can just draw it directly, because now it's in world space. So the gizmo drawing function is already going to draw in the correct position. Um, but the thing we're going to solve now is what local space position do we need to place this object in order for it to match our world space position? That's the problem now, right? Uh, so now we define coordinates for our world space points. Uh, that's this uh, big cyan thing. Uh, maybe we should use a different color for the uh, local space object. It's going to be yellow. Um, OK, so now our goal is to uh, place this yellow dot here using local space coordinates. Uh, because this one is now in world space. So how do we figure out what are the local space coordinates uh, that this would have if it was in this space, right? Um, so essentially what we need to do is we need to transform this world space point into the local space of this transform. All right, um, so let's make a function for that. World points. Um, okay. Let's go back to the drawing board, like literally, not the, the figurative version. Uh, I don't know if we can undo a bunch of this, because I kind of want the same thing, but without the clutter. Uh, it's just some, there's some blue goop here. We just have to accept that. I'm not going to clean that up. I'm sorry. Now we have another problem. <clears throat> now we kind of have the, the opposite problem, where um, we have a point, and that point is in world space. So this is now relative to world space. Um, Actually, that's a weird example because it's very aligned. There we go. What a vector. Cool. Great. So so now, let's see. So now we have a world space position. Uh, if I have a world space position here, then these coordinates are approximately, let's see, on the x-axis, we have around 3. So we have 3. And on the y-axis, we have like 2 point something. Sorry, I want it to be better with colors now. 2 point, let's say 2.5 for simplicity's sake. Okay, there we go. We have a world space coordinate. So so this is very specifically the world space coordinates. This is not the, the local space coordinates. So maybe uh, let's position them by this vector. So we remember that this is specifically the world space one. Uh, okay, so we have the world space position. Uh, but what we actually want now is the local space position. So the local space position uh, from the point of view of this transform also very often referred to as frame of reference. Uh, so whenever someone says transform, frame of reference, uh, space, all of these words are very interchangeable. Um, oh, matrix sometimes, like transformation matrix. Um, so, so now, given this frame of reference, then we want this vector going from the origin to that one in local space. OK. So what we need to do to make this transformation is kind of the opposite, or like the reverse of uh, what we did with the other one. Uh, so remember how when we transformed from local space to world space, um, the first thing we did was to figure out how do we get the world space direction of this? Uh, because the local space one is kind of trivial because we have those coordinates already. Uh, we had two and one. But then we want to convert this to world space. And we did that by multiplying the basis vector uh, with each component. So the x basis vector multiplied by the x component, y basis vector multiplied by the y component. Oh, and then finally, we added the position of the transform itself. OK, now we want to do the opposite. Um, so, so one thing we could do is we can kind of think about this just like in the reverse process. Um, so the last thing we did for the previous one was that we added the world space position. So if we want to go from world to local, uh, the first thing we want to do is to make this point relative to this point. And what I mean by making it relative to this point is that um, it's still in world space, but it's now going to be relative to this point 
in terms of the vector is the vector between the world space position of this object and the world space position of this object. Um, so that gives us this vector right here. I'm going to erase this because this makes it confusing. Okay, so if we take this coordinate and subtract it by this vector, uh, we're going to get the relative vector uh, in world space. So we have this vector relative to this coordinate, but the orientation of this one is still referencing these two. So the coordinates are not actually in local space yet. All we've done is subtracted the position of this one. Um, so the space we're working in um, kind of looks like this right now, because um, it's still aligned with world space, um, but not aligned with local space. Uh, so now we have the world space offset of this one. And now, if you remember, we talked a lot about the dot product. And the dot product, again, if you have normalized vectors, which just so happens that these vectors, the basis vectors, are also normalized because they have the length of one, right? And if you have a dot product where one of the vectors is normalized and the other one is not, then what this essentially is going to do is that it's going to project this onto that axis. And then what we get out of it is the um, technically the signed distance, but the distance here is what we get with the dot product between the basis vector and the, uh, the relative vector we have over there. Uh, that gives us the um, signed distance here. Uh, or no, sorry, it gives us this signed distance. Um, very important. Um, not this. I'm sorry. I messed up. It's over. You're not going to learn anything now. Oh, geez. Hope you didn't write that down. Uh, it's going to get cluttered. I hope you see what I mean. <laughs> um, there we go. Uh, so that's going to give us that distance, uh, except it should actually be accurate. Um, okay. Now that we have this distance, um, what does this distance actually represent? Well, this is the local space x-coordinate, right? By projecting this, we get a scalar value. Again, the dot product does not give us a vector. It gives us a scalar. And that scalar is this vector projected onto this vector and the length here. So what we need to do then is just the same thing, uh, but with a y-axis. Uh, so we we do the same thing. We project this onto the y-axis. That's the this same equation. Let's copy that. There we go. Let's make it smaller because it's it's getting very cramped here. Then we do the same thing, but for the y-axis this time. So what we're going to get out of this is now the signed distance here, and again. This is literally the y component of the local space coordinate of this position. Yeah, so that's that's how we can transform between these two spaces. Um, same how we use dot normalized vector for direction and linear velocity to find velocity in a specific direction. Yes, and we talked about that on the last stream. And uh, the stream is available on my Twitch in case you want to check out yesterday's, wait, two days ago's lecture, uh, in case you're interested to see how you can use the dot product for velocities and stuff. Um, anyway, uh, so this is a way that we can then go from world space to local space. All right, uh, I guess we should also actually implement this because now we've just written a bunch of diagrams and um, it's, it's not super practical. So, so let's write this function. Okay, the first thing we did was to find this blue vector in world space. So we want, we want to get this point relative to this other world space point. Uh, so I usually, um, whenever I do something like this, I usually call it the relative point. Um, I don't know if that's good, but just my internal terminology. Um, so relative point is then going to be the world point. Uh, minus the um, the object position here in world space. So that's object position. And now we have the relative point. So the relative point here 
is now this vector in world space. Okay. <clears throat> and then we need to project this into or onto the basis vectors of the um, of this transform. So we have the the right axis and the up axis, and they are right here. And then we do the dot product between the um, x-axis basis vector and this world space relative vector. And again, these basis vectors are in world space. Uh, whenever you do transform dot right, transform dot up, these are in world space. Um, if you want to get the local space basis vectors, um, that is literally just new vector two one zero, um, because this one is pointing to the right. Uh, and that's it. Like the, there's not much more to it. Or vector two dot right. So in local space, the basis vectors are very trivial and doesn't really contain much information. Um, so usually you would use them in world space. So this is world space basis vectors of this object. Okay. Uh, so we have the relative point, and now we need to project them. So let's start with the x-axis. So floats x coordinate, or let's just call it x. <clears throat> Float x equals vector two dot dot. And we want to project this relative point onto the x-axis, which is right, and that's it. So this is now already projected this into local space, and it already handles negative values because, again, um, if the dot product arrows, if you consider like the green y-axis here, that one is pointing away from this one. So this is going to be a negative value. So this distance here is a negative distance, which again, it's a negative coordinate because it's below the uh, origin on the y-axis, right? Sorry, this origin. Cool. So we have the x-axis. Then we do the same thing for the y-axis. Uh, project the relative point onto the up axis or the up basis vector. Uh, and that's basically it. Then we can return new vector to x, y. So that was a very, like a lot of theory for a tiny amount of code. Um, <laughs> so I apologize if it feels like I'm doing a lot of redundancy and repeating stuff too much. Uh, but this is really important to like have it like baked into your head, like exactly how the dot product works, exactly how space works and all of that stuff. Um, because even if you've done a lot of, um, even if you done, have done a lot of like space transformation stuff before, you sometimes mess this up anyway. So might as well learn it properly. Um, okay, so we have world to local. Uh, we haven't actually tested this. Hopefully it'll work unless I mess something up. Um, this yellow object is a child object of um, this transform. That's why it's automatically moving together with this one when we're rotating it and everything. Um, and yes, so all we need to do now is um, we want to set the local space position of that transform, which I believe we have assigned here. Uh, so that's the local object transform. Uh, and we have the world space point, so all I need to do now is local space object transform dot local position uh, equals uh, world to local, and then we pass our world space point in there. So this should now properly transform from world to local. There we go. So now the now it sits here. The child object is now changing position. Um, even if we're moving this object here, um, it's now changing the position of this child object to exactly match the world space position. So if we look at the coordinates here, it says 0.59, uh, negative 0.89, um, which looks correct. 0 0.5 is sort of halfway here. Um, negative 0 0.9 would be down here somewhere on the y-axis. Um, and if we then take this object and rotate it or something, move it further away, and now we'll look at the local space coordinates, uh, 2.24 and 2.57. So it does seem to work, and it's exactly located at the world space position that we defined here, um, regardless of where we put this world space position, right? Um, yeah. Thanks there. Uh, okay, so let's see. I'm trying to figure out like how much, um, how much I should talk about now. Um, because we are soon going for lunch and Thor is currently holding control. So that is modifying my actions, which makes things difficult. All right. I think we, uh, I think we can talk about, I think we can talk about matrices. Let's do matrices.
Uh, so, Thor? Buddy? You're, you're kind of in the way. Matrices in math is a very broad topic. Uh, and I personally know almost none of it. Um, so I'm going to talk about matrices pretty much exclusively in the context of space transformation. Um, there are other use cases for matrices, uh, but primarily matrices are used in a way that is called a transformation matrix. Um, so if we think about what we, we, we just did, right? We have our X axis, right? We have our Y axis. And we have our Z axis. Uh, no, wait, that is incorrect. That is uh, not, in fact, how that works. Uh, sorry, I want to get this right because I don't want to draw incorrect stuff. Uh, a little side note. Um, the reason that it might be important to get this right is because uh, different engines and different like um, and well, engines or anything where you use coordinates, um, they can have different coordinate systems. Um, so if you are, um, looking at something like this, um, then these two are, are using different coordinate systems and they use a different, what's called handedness, um, because these are not equivalent. Uh, and like you need to convert between these two in case you're like working in an application that has a different coordinate system. Um, so yeah, so so in addition to the handedness um, that ca like the handedness can be different, but on top of that, different engines also use different vectors um, to be up. Uh, so for instance, the Unity is left-handed Y up, uh, Unreal is left-handed Z up. Um, so in Unreal. Um, you would basically uh, tip this one over like that. And then the uh, z-axis would be here and the y-axis would be here. And then you would have the Unreal Engine uh, basis vectors in world space. Um, and this is different in different engines. Uh, Blender, I think, is right-handed. Uh, Maya and 3D Max is right-handed. Um, it, it's a mess and everything's a nightmare. Uh, so you need to keep that in mind. Uh, sometimes uh, it's important to know the difference. Okay, anyway, that was a bit of a side note. Doesn't really matter in this case, um, but we'll get into when it matters. It starts mattering a lot once we're talking about rotations. So we have been talking about this thing called basis vectors, right? Um, like I mentioned, uh, it's the directions that these are pointing uh, in world space, or more precisely, in the parent space um, of these. So, so if you are talking about, or actually world space, sorry. Uh, so if we think about, okay, this vector is pointing in some direction, uh, just like uh, this red vector right here, uh, this is pointing in a direction in world space. Um, and what is this? Well, uh, it's less than one on the x-axis, maybe it's 0.9 and 0.2 or something, but it has a length of one, right? Uh, so what these are, are the basis vectors of this transform. Um, and then, of course, we have the position of this object. So the position of this object uh, would be the vector going from uh, world space origin um, to this object position, right? Okay, so hello there. We have the position and these three arrows. Not only do these are, are these arrows used for um, not only are they used for determining what is local space, but these also define the rotation of this object. Uh, if you are uh, doing something in code, uh, or like Unity has a bunch of objects, has a bunch of transforms, uh, the actual rotation of the object is not stored anywhere. Um, when you are modifying Euler angles or quaternions, uh, those are fake, they don't exist, and they're all they're only there to help you do operations on these vectors. Um, so in actuality, when you are doing stuff with rotations, the way rotations are stored and the way positions are stored and the way scale is stored is in a single data type called a matrix. And this is actually really cool that this is kind of possible to even do this. Um, so so the way that things work in games is that um, 
or usually in games, they have a matrix. In Unity, it's called matrix 4x4. Four four. Uh, and a matrix is just a different way of saying uh, that you have a 2D array, pretty much. So a matrix 4x4 four four has uh, four items by four items. Did not draw that very well, so I'm going to redo this. Um, this is great. What a grid. Isn't that neat? So internally, when you are talking about a transform in Unity, including rotation, position, um, and scale, all of that is stored in a single data type called matrix. And now you might ask, OK, but how is it stored? Um, so the way that this is stored is that we have talked about the basis vectors, right? And just like you know the basis vectors we had before in the 2D case, was something like this, right? And if you want to know, you know, what are the components of this basis vector? Well, in world space, uh, I would guess on the x-axis, it would be like 0. Um, 0. 0.9. And on, on the y-axis, um, it would be something like 0. 0.2. Uh, so, so these are the, the world space coordinates for the direction of this basis vector. So these two coordinates, or if we are going to 3D, which we are now, we would also have a Z coordinate. In this case, it would be zero. So these three coordinates are stored in the matrix. So the matrix contains the directions of each of the basis vectors. So if you look at a matrix, the x-axis is actually stored here. This is where the x-axis basis vector lives in a matrix. Uh, and otherwise, these are uh, just x, y, and z values. Uh, you have x, you have y, you have z, and you have some numbers here, right? Um, so if you want to define a, uh, a transformation matrix and you want it to be just the x-axis, this could be anything. So we could use these numbers. It might be 0.9. Uh, and it might have 0 0.2 for the y-axis, or for the y component of the x-axis. Sorry, things might get confusing. Uh, then zero. Um, so what these represent is the world space direction of this basis vector. And then you just do the same for the other ones. So, so the y component would also have numbers here. So the y component lives here, and the z component lives here. So that's basically transform.write, yes. Uh, this is transform.write, transform.up, transform.forward. So if you have no rotation at all, if your object does not have any rotation, as in it's aligned with world space, then the x-axis uh, would point directly along x, and then it would be 0 on the other two components of this direction. And then the y-axis uh, would point directly upwards, and the z-axis would point only along the world space z direction. And what you are looking at here is called the identity matrix. Um, or we haven't, we haven't gone through these yet, so you could consider this to be an identity 3x3 three three matrix. Um, so uh, an identity matrix means that if we are using this to transform something, it's going to be unchanged. So this one is just sitting directly uh, at the world space orientation, right? So when you are rotating an object, it doesn't actually store quaternion components. It doesn't store Euler angles. All it's doing is that it's modifying these numbers. That's it. So internally, this is used everywhere for all transformations that happen, um, from local space to world space, um, to uh, in rendering, it's used everywhere. Um, so this is kind of the kind of the, the magic construct that kind of handles all space transformation and rotations for us. Um, quaternions are still used to apply these operations, uh, but when storing data um, and converting between spaces, we're using matrices. OK, this is not a complete picture. So, um, so now you might ask, why is it 4x4? Four four? Well, it is 4x4 four four because we are not actually storing the complete data about this object. The only thing we're storing here is the orientation. Uh, we know where these axes are pointing, but we don't know the position of this object. So if we want to know the position of this object, 
that is also encoded in here. Um, so uh, let me just, maybe I should mark these somehow. So, okay. So this specifies the orientation or rotation, whatever terminology you want to use. Uh, so that's uh, the this three by three grid here. Okay. So now the way that position is stored in these matrices uh, is this column here. So you have the position here. So if you want to do the identity matrix, then um, you would only have ones along the diagonal. So if you want to have a position at zero, uh, you would have these components right here. Um, and these would then together define the position. Um, okay, cool. So now we have, uh, we have a matrix and we are actually able to store the orientation of this object. In other words, the world space direction of each of these um, axes. Oh, Z should not be one, sorry. Um, I'm skipping ahead. Um, so so that's the, the, the world space position now is at zero, now that I fixed it. Um, sorry for any confusion. So now we've encoded the position and the orientation, but we're, we haven't done all of it yet. Uh, we are missing scale. Uh, so, so what is scale? Actually, let, let's do the bottom row first, because this one is awkward and strange. Um, the bottom row is um, kind of vestigial. It's sort of unused, but for the math to work out, it kind of sits there and it just exists. Um, so it's like in 99% of cases, uh, you're going to have zero in all of these and you're going to have one here. Um, in some engines and in some very specific like projection things, if you're doing rendering, uh, you might have values here. Uh, but for for the mo for the purposes of just linear transformations, which is what we're talking about now, uh, you will only use this space right here. The the extra row is more because the way the matrix multiplication is used um, or is defined in mathematics um, makes use of these, even though they might be zero and one here. What would those four values represent? Uh, fucky coordinate shenanigans that I have no idea how it works. Okay. So we're almost done. So yes, you might be asking, where is scale? Um, so scale does not exist here. Uh, if you put scale here, all the math is going to break and it's not going to work the way that you expect it to. Um, so because again, matrix multiplication is very rigidly defined in mathematics and it works in a specific way. So, so scale, how does scale work? The way that scale works is that you modify the orientation here. You can modify the basis vectors. And when you do that, you automatically bake scale into it, depending on what values you uh, shove in here. Uh, so if we instead pass a value of two, we have now scaled this object to be twice as tall or scaled this coordinate space to be twice as tall. Um, and by extension, uh, we have now also scaled any objects that happen to be uh, rendering under this coordinate system and so forth. Um, so depending on what these values are, that would set the scale. Um, so to be more precise, the length of this vector is the y scale. The length of this vector is the x scale. The length of this vector is the z scale. Yeah, so, so that's, that's how, how you define uh, scale and even non-uniform scale, you know, where, uh, where scale is different on one axis compared to the other ones. So it seems kind of ironic that it's actually sometimes kind of computationally expensive just to know what scale you have on one axis, uh, because technically you need to calculate the length of this vector, right? Uh, will the magnitude of transform.write up forward be consistent with the matrix magnitude? I don't think so. I'm pretty sure transform.write up and forward give you directions as in normalized in world space. Uh, so you won't actually get the scaled uh, vectors there. Uh, we are running out of time before lunch, so I'm going to talk about how you can use this in practice. Um, so let me just add that scale is part of this too. So this is scale and orientation is defined in this 3x3 three three grid. Okay, 
Uh, so this is how matrices work. Um, any, or rather, how the data is stored in them. We haven't really talked about how they work and how they're applied, but we're going to get to that. Um, OK, any questions before we go for lunch? So the values are multiplied by scale. Um, kind of, yes, but it's sort of the other way around. Um, scale is defined by the length of these. Uh, it's sort of saying the same thing, um, but but the, the causality is flipped, right? Like scale is defined by the length of the, the, the y scale is defined by the length of the y vector and so forth. What about gimbal lock and matrices versus quaternions? Uh, matrices uh, don't have anything to do with gimbal lock. They are completely separate. Um, quaternions uh, kind of solve the problem of gimbal lock, and gimbal locking is a very specific problem when you're defining rotations using Euler angles. Um, and no, we have not talked a lot about rotations. We haven't even talked about angles. This is just vector math and matrices so far. So we ignore bottom row. For the most part, yes. The the if you um, unless you're doing something very very specific, um, the bottom row should always be this. Um, so so the bottom row is if you want to do some very funky coordinate systems that are non-Euclidean or whatever. What is orientation now again? Um, orientation up here is the, well, quote unquote, the rotation of the object. It's just a different way of saying rotation, right? This is defined by each of these components. All of these vectors, as in the directions that these have in world space, they are themselves three values, right? You have x, y, and z. Uh, and these three values are stored inside of this matrix right here. And yeah, like someone mentioned, if you do transform.right, you will get this vector, which is the same thing as this direction in world space. But transform.right, etc., I'm pretty sure that does not take scale into account. So those are normalized, uh, which these might not be. Um, shouldn't row major matrices position be in the bottom row, the shenanigans be in the rightmost? Um, so there are a bunch of like separate conventions that different like in different contexts, if you're doing things in OpenGL versus in Unity, um, then sometimes uh, the row versus column is flipped. Uh, so you, sometimes they might store the x-axis here, y-axis here, um, and so forth, um, which uh, sucks. And um, mostly memory memory layout thing, like in terms of how you access them in the arrays, I would guess, rather than how they mathematically are laid out. Um, all of these values are floats, yes. Uh, if you're doing shaders, these are going to be called more accurately. I really like the shaders do this. Eh. It's called float 4x4 four four when you are coding in um, the HLSL or CG. It turns out I lied to you all. Uh, you should never listen to me again. Unsubscribe. This was cringe. Um, I'm going to try to correct my mistake. You know, you almost never directly go into looking at this actual structure or like getting um, individual like cells in this 2D grid. Um, so I'm not too familiar with those. I just know approximately how they work. And yeah, so this is how it actually works. Uh, it doesn't make much of a difference at all in terms of everything I've told you so far. It's just that the layout is slightly different. The layout is actually not in rows, um, so the x-axis does not lie here, the x-axis lies here. Um, so they lie in columns, not rows, um, which is important because <clears throat> these should not be part of the axis. Um, so if we were to do this using a row layout, uh, the position would be down here, uh, which in some cases, uh, that's the way it is. But in mathematics, um, and in some engines, uh, you would have a column layout. Um, so, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna correct that. Um, hopefully, by just changing the axes of these. There we go. So this is the actual layout. Now we're now we're back. I hope, unless like these are reversed or something, but it's whatever. You get the idea. All right. So essentially, the only difference, um, the this axis is defined in columns here. Um, and, and so are the other ones. Uh, so the y-axis is this column, z-axis is this column, and so forth. And then you have the position in this column, also sometimes called translation. Um, I just had to double check because I felt like it was a little bit weird that they were part of the directional vectors. So I double checked and I was wrong. So 
Anyway, I corrected things. Okay, so now you might ask yourself, what is the purpose of storing it in this way in particular? Um, you know, why does this, um, this bottom row really exist? The short answer is basically that you can do something with matrices where you multiply a matrix with a vector. Uh, so you can do matrix multiplied by a vector. And what you're going to get out of that is another vector. Um, probably shouldn't we call it V, V1, V2. There we go. Um, so we're going to get out of this as another vector. Um, so if you take this entire matrix, multiply it by a vector, which in matrix notation would be um, a column like this, uh, where you would have X and Y and Z and W. Um, so if you multiply these two together, what you are going to get is you're going to transform this from local space to world space. That's the magic of how this works. Um, so the way matrix multiplication is defined makes it so that multiplying a vector with this matrix literally does a transformation using that matrix. Um, and it presumes that this is the uh, local to world matrix, which it's not always. You can have different matrices. Uh, you can have a world to local matrix. But the point is, you can use matrices to transform vectors between coordinate spaces. It takes rotation, position, and every, all of that into account by just doing that. Uh, so that's really powerful. Uh, so we have been looking at doing this manually so far, um, but we could do this using matrices. We, we don't actually need to use this, of course, but what we could do uh, is that we could use the matrix to do the exact same thing. Uh, I don't know if you want to see how you would do that. Uh, or if it matters that much. Anyway, so you might also be wondering, uh, what is W? Like, what is what is happening down here? Uh, my coordinates are X, Y, Z, and what does the W mean? So the technically, if you want to do a raw matrix vector multiplication, let's uh, specify vector. If you want to do a matrix vector multiplication, then W is generally going to be either 0 or 1. Uh, and depending on if W is 0 or 1, you're going to get different types of transformations. Uh, so if vector or if W is 1, you are transforming a point, as in that's the stuff that we did here. We have a point in world space, and then we want to transform that to a point in local space. If W is 0, you're going to transform the vector. Um, and what that means is that it's not going to take position into account. Position is going to be discarded. None of this is going to matter. It's only going to take, actually, this is discarded. Um, and it's only going to take the rotation into account. Um, so if this is 0, then you're transforming only the direction. So that's only used for like, um, or not direction, sorry, only the local vector. So that doesn't take position into account, but you can use it just to transform directions from one space to another or transform relative vectors. Um, in practice, you're almost never going to have to specify W manually, because usually you would use transformation functions in Unity. Um, so in Unity, you would have a local position. And then you have a world position. And then if you want to transform between these two, you would use functions in the transform. Um, and the functions that you would use for that is there is one called um, transform point. Uh, so transform point would uh, takes a local space position, um, and then you get a world space position out of that. Uh, if you want to go the other way around, then let me just copy this because it's a long word. We don't like long words. Yep. Uh, the other way around, if you want to go from world to local, uh, that is called inverse. 
transform point. Uh, it's kind of annoying that they're not called local to world and world to local. Uh, so you kind of have to remember which is which or double check IntelliSense or the documentation uh, to make sure that you're using the correct one in the correct in the correct case. Um, so, so these are the two main functions you would use. And it's transform dot transform point, transform dot inverse transform point. Um, so the word point here is, is doing a lot of work. Um, it's very important to know which one you're using and why. Uh, so uh, what they mean by point is that um, it's going to interpret these as points and not relative vectors. Um, so that's the W component that we were talking about earlier, where if W is 1, it's going to interpret them as points. Um, but if w is zero, it's going to interpret it as a vector that is just relative, where we don't care about the position, we just want the same vector but in a different space. So those are called transform vector. Uh, there's a third one called transform direction, and transform direction makes sure that the length is one, uh, so that it's always normalized. Um, so this is useful to remember. Um, so if we were to replace our code with that, we can comment this out. Um, there we go. So our local to world, instead of doing it manually, um, we would do, um, let's see, we would do transform dot uh, transform point, and then we pass a local point into that. Uh, so this is essentially a local to world. Uh, and then the world to local, like I mentioned before, um, sort of the same thing, it's just called inverse transform point. What you're saying is if you multiply a 4 by 4 with a vector 4, you're multiplying each column in the matrix with each row in the vector. If w is 0, you ignore the last column in the matrix. Pretty much, yes. Um, I don't actually, I don't know fully how it multiplies them, uh, but I would guess that it's equivalent to the stuff that we did when we did it manually, as in we take the basis vectors and multiplying them by each component, right? So it would take the x component, multiply it by this column, Y component multiplied by this column, Z component by this column, and W component multiplied by this one. So if that's zero, the position is not taken into account, and then it adds them all up. I don't, I'm not entirely sure if that's how it works, but I'm, I would guess that that's how it works, yeah. Okay, so uh, most matrices, if you just have a context and you do yada yada dot matrix, um, they're going to be a local to world matrix. So that's kind of the default as far as I know. Um, so so sometimes you want to do the other way around. You want a world, um, a world to local instead of local to world. Uh, in that case, you need to get the inverse of the matrix. Um, and I don't know how to calculate that, but you can. Uh, there's a built-in function in in matrices. So if you, um, let's say, you have a, well, transform itself has uh, <gasps> the uh, local to world matrix right here, and the world to local matrix in in case you want to use them manually. So if you have a, a local to world matrix, you can do dot inverse if you want the inverse of that matrix. Um, so then you would flip it. Um, yeah. So so generally, if you want to transform coordinates, this is how you would do it. And this would automatically take everything into account. It would take rotation into account. It would take uh, scale into account. Everything is there, right? Um, yeah. Whereas if you were to use the matrix manually, you would have to do like new vector four, and you would need to specify the the W component manually to do, to like say which type of transformation you want to do if it's just a vector or if it's a world space uh, position that you want to transform. Okay. Any questions about that? An inverse matrix is a normal matrix mirrored. Um, I don't think it is, but I could be wrong. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure you have to calculate the inverse matrix. Like that's an expensive operation to do, but I could be wrong. I don't. I don't like look at the exact math very often. I mostly just use the existing libraries. Um, but it's not just a matter of like flipping it along the diagonal or something. I'm pretty sure, uh, because that wouldn't actually get you the world to local. Isn't that a transpose matrix? I think so. Yeah. Oh, was the distinction between transform point, vector, and direction clear? Or should I show an example of that? Actually, I can just quickly mention it. Remember when we were transforming things in uh, from world to local? So in this one, we were going from world space to local space. We wanted to get this um, this position in local space. <clears throat> so in order to do that, we initially subtracted the position, and then we projected it onto those and everything like that, right? 
uh, and we ended up with this vector down here. So that means that we are transforming the point and we're interpreting this as a point that we then want to get as a point in another space. If you do transform uh, vector instead, uh, then what you're going to get instead of this one is that you're going to get the, the same direction like this, um, but in the local space here. So, so this would be transform vector, whereas this would be transform point. Um, and it's the same thing the other way around. So it's mostly like I have a direction in, um, or not a direction, sorry. It works for directions too, uh, but you have a vector and you want it to be relative, uh, as in position should not be taken into account. Uh, in that case, you are just transforming it to the other space, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, because these two are not the same. Like if you look at the, the coordinates here, uh, they're vastly different than these two coordinates, right? Um, so th this would be a transform vector. Uh, there's another one called transform direction, which is pretty much the same thing, but Unity makes sure that it's normalized. Uh, so after you've transformed it, um, it makes sure it has a length of one. Uh, so direction in Unity is sort of a, a word that kind of means that um, it's it's a normalized vector, right? Um, so that's the difference between a transform vector points and direction. Uh, so so that is like anytime you want some direction in some other space, you would use transform direction uh, or transform vector. Um, but if you want to point in some other space, you would use transform points. So it so really depends on the use case. Uh, so let's see. I'm trying to think of an example. Um, so uh, so let's say I have. Um, Let's say I have my rocket in my little game, you know, the one that can like fly around. It's got these little, little wings um, and it's got this engine. Um, all right. So this rocket has a velocity, right? Uh, we haven't really gone into physics yet, but uh, you can represent velocity as a vector. Uh, so say you're going in some direction. Um, so velocity in unity is always in world space. Uh, so uh, if you have a velocity in this direction, uh, of some rigid body. And let's say you want to know what is this velocity in the local space of this rocket, because the rocket itself has a local space too, right? You have an x-axis, um, you have a uh, y-axis, uh, but this velocity, um, maybe you need that in local space of the rocket so that you can do, um, I don't know, maybe you have like some flags attached to it and you want the flags to animate in some direction based on what the local space uh, velocity is, right? Uh, like that kind of stuff where, where you want to tweak something about this one where you need like how much is this one going to the left or right um, in the local space of this rocket. So then that's a case where you would use transform vector, not transform point, because that would mean something completely different. Um, because the vector doesn't have, it doesn't represent a location. It's just a, a relative offset and, and a velocity, right? Cool. Any questions so far? My biggest pet peeve is when people call their velocity variable speed. That is a little weird. But you know what? People are learning and it's a good learning opportunity. Isn't speed the magnitude of the velocity vector? Yes. Um, velocity is a vector. Speed is the magnitude of the velocity vector so that the, the speed is just a scalar. Um, and in most cases, speed can never be negative um, because it's the length of a vector and the length of a vector can never be negative. There are some cases where you might want to have the concept of assigned speed. Um, but yeah. All right, we covered a bunch. Okay, we haven't really talked about 3D vectors, but I feel like everything we've talked about in terms of 2D vectors generalized to 3D. It's exactly the same thing, but we add one more axis. Um, so I don't think there's that much more we need to say about 3D vectors, unless you have questions about it. But yeah, like dot products, all of that works exactly the same for 3D. What's the use case for matrix 4x4? Um, the use case for matrix 4x4, um, it's kind of like uh, having a transform component <coughs> in Unity means that you have the overhead of having game objects and all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, but a matrix uh, doesn't require a game object. Um, so if you're doing things like um, instance rendering, where you want to like draw meshes from code, um, then you need to supply matrices to say where you want to draw them at what scale and at what orientation. Um, so matrices are uh, kind of the, the purest form of a transform. 
Um, it, it's not a component. It's not like it's completely unrelated to um, game objects, right? Um, so this is kind of the uh, generic container for everything related to transforming um, vectors or matrices and so forth. Um, oh, I forgot to mention something, uh, which is probably kind of important. We multiplied a matrix with a vector before, right? Um, you can multiply a matrix with a matrix. Uh, if you multiply a matrix with another matrix, that is equivalent to combining those two transforms. So if you have two matrices in order, then um, if you have like a hierarchy of objects in Unity, for instance, that's a case where you have a chain of matrices that you then apply in order to end up with a single matrix that is combined that represents the child's child objects uh, transforming to world. Um, so you can multiply matrices together in order to combine uh, things as if they were child objects. Um, so you can even do stuff with hierarchy uh, without having a hierarchy of game objects using matrices. Uh, you kind of quote unquote get that for free, uh, or at least it's easier. You don't have to like do all the transformations yourself. You can just multiply the matrices together and everything works. Um, yeah, so, so this is just a, a raw data type that can represent transformations. Yeah, and you would you you might use them a lot in when making doing shaders and rendering, um, whether you know it or not, because a lot of the macros in Unity use matrices all the time when you're, you're transforming transforming points. Um, and again, in shaders, you transform points a lot. You go a lot between um, you know um, local space to world space to tangent space to clip space, to view space, you you do that quite a lot in shaders. So so that is something that um, if you want to do like more advanced type of shaders with a lot of vertex transformations, uh, those kinds of matrices are kind of ubiquitous and you need to like know how they uh, function or rather how you use them. Will that get an average position fa facing for both matrix factors? No, it will get a combined transformation. Uh, so if you have world space here and you have a child object here, and then maybe you have another child object, like here you have some, some other objects. Um, why is this drawing black? There we go. Uh, so you have another object here. Um, let's say this one is a child of this one. Um, then this matrix probably represents the transformation to go from this to this, not to go from world to this, or this to world, rather. Um, so when you have this hierarchy of transformations like this, um, if you multiply these two together, uh, you get the transformation that goes between uh, these two. Uh, so you don't have to use the intermediate matrix there. Uh, so if you combine these two, you then have a matrix that represents the full transformation from this space to world space and world space and back. Um, whereas if you just have this matrix being relative to this matrix, um, then you would have to like apply them in order, which can be computationally expensive. So sometimes it's good to like cache the matrix that represents the entire transformation. So you can like multiply them together to combine them, if that makes sense. Um, what is tangent space? Uh, that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a tangent, uh, that goes into more like shader stuff, but, um, very, very uh, short explanation. If you have a surface, this is 3D, uh, then uh, generally we talked earlier about the fact that you have a normal of that surface, right? Uh, that normal is perpendicular uh, to the surface, um, right? So this is the, the, the normal. And then like sometimes you need to construct basis vectors around um, rendering something on the surface. Um, so, so for instance, um, you might need to know what is this direction right here. Um, so this direction, which is the x-axis, um, this would be the tangent. Uh, because this one, instead of being normal to the surface, as in perpendicular to it, it is tangent to the surface, as in flush with the surface. Um, so that's the tangent. Uh, and then if you do the full coordinate system, uh, you would get the bitangent here. Uh, and here we have the normal. Um, this is tangent space. That's it. Um, so if you are doing something like uh, tangent space normal maps, which is the most common form of normal maps, uh, you need tangent space in your matrix. Um, 
because your your normal maps has a vector in tangent space, uh, but when you are in a shader, you often need to know what is that vector in world space. Um, so what you do is that um, you use tangent space, and from this you uh, construct a a float three by three, and this is a matrix. Uh, so this matrix is um, is only containing rotation, uh, sometimes called a rotation matrix, where um, it's only got these three axes, and if you multiply stuff with this one, you're only going to get the... You can only transform vectors. You can never transform positions, uh, because the position of this one is not stored. It, it only contains the orientation information, but that's all we need. So, so essentially, what the tangent space normal maps contain, uh, the texture itself um, has, a has a bunch of texels here, right? And each of these texels uh, contain a normal pointing in various directions, right? Uh, so depending on where these are pointing, uh, we're then going to use the uh, tangent space in order to transform these uh, from uh, tangent space to world space, or whatever space we're doing lighting in, rather. Um, yeah, so, so that's what the normal app contains, and in the shader we will use uh, tangent space in order to transform that. Um, that's what tangent space is. Oh, right, uh, this is a good time to talk about the cross products. Um, the cross products. That is another way that, uh, of multiplying vectors together. Uh, the cross product is sort of a special case uh, that you can do with 3D vectors. There is a 2D equivalent, but we're going to get to that later. Um, so, all right, so if you have... Um, actually, we can use this one. If you have the normal vector and you have the tangent vector, um, <clears throat> then you might want to calculate this one. You might want to know what is the bitangent. Uh, like, say you have the normal, you know exactly what direction it's pointing, you know exactly where tangent is pointing, um, but you need to know this one. So there are a lot of like convoluted ways of getting it. Uh, like maybe you can do something where like, okay, uh, we take the tangent vector uh, and then we rotate it 90 degrees around the uh, normal uh, and we need to use a matrix to do that. and like. That is over-engineered, it's too complicated, we don't need to do that. So, very, very simple explanation of the cross product. Um, the way that I sort of visualize the, the cross product in my head um, is that the cross product of two vectors, oh, in math, it's usually a, a and then an x, b, so this is how you would write the cross product. Um, so this is cross, um, and then the dot product would be a dot like this. That's why they have the names that they do. Um, so that's the dot product. Um, importantly, dot product returns a scalar, a single value, because it's a scalar projection. Cross product returns a vector. So what the cross product does is if you send, uh, for instance, if you give this one the, um, the normal, and the tangent that we have over there, we are going to get the bitangent. There we go. Um, so more generally, uh, the cross product, if you give it two vectors, it will always return a vector that is perpendicular to both. There is some exception if the if both of your vectors are pointing in the exact same direction, like if they're equivalent, the cross product will be very sad and it will return a zero vector, which doesn't have a direction. Um, but that's a special case. So whenever you need a vector that's perpendicular to two other vectors, the cross product will do exactly that. And it is super useful for many, many different things. Um, so uh, a, a good example is, um, for example, if you are in a video game, you have an FPS camera and you want to look around the world. Quite often you need to use the cross product there in order to figure out what axes are we, um, like what axes are we rotating around? And when we look to the right, what ax ac like what direction do we actually want to look in? Another example would be if you want to, um, this is kind of hard to talk about without being like really good at drawing, because um, it involves perspective. 
Uh, but anyway, essentially, in a lot of cases, you have things like normal of a surface, and then the direction the player is looking in, which might not be uh, axis aligned or might not be perpendicular. But let's say you have the uh, normal of the surface and you have some direction that the player is looking in and you want to know what what is the direction to the right. Uh, and you can use the dot, uh, the cross product with these two. Uh, some of the one of the things that you need to watch out for is that if these two are perpendicular and they are normalized, then this one will also be normalized. Uh, but if these two are not perpendicular, so if you rotate up the red vector, like up there, uh, then in that case, the return vector is going to be shorter. Uh, so if we start rotating this one, uh, the output of this one is going to get shorter and shorter, the closer these are together. Uh, so if you want a pure direction, uh, you need to normalize this one, uh, unless these two vectors are um, perpendicular. Uh, so the way that I usually uh, think about this is it's a little bit easier to um, to swap the axes around. Uh, so if you consider, uh, it's it's sort of the same thing for all of these. Uh, so this is my mental model whenever I think about the cross product. Um, X cross Y gives you Z. If they are perpendicular, everything's going to work out the way you want it to. Um, the, and that's sort of it. So So whenever I think about the... Um, whenever I think about the cross product, um, this is what's in my head. I always think about this. Um, so I imagine uh, x is the first argument, y is the second argument, this is the vector I'm going to get. Um, and that's it. So sometimes if I'm like, okay, I have the, I actually did that just now off screen, where uh, we had the blue and the red one, right? And I was like, oh, right, what order do we have the blue one and the, the red one? or the red one and the blue one in order to get the green one. Well, my mental model, again, I just do x is the first argument, y is the second argument, and then I get um, z axis as the result of the cross product. Uh, so if we're working with um, the red and blue of this system, then I can just take this one and try to figure out, okay, how do we get the resulting being the green one? So now I'm like, okay, um, this is a little complicated and convoluted, I'm sorry. So in this case, I saw that, okay, we start with the blue one, end with the red one, and then we are gonna get the blue one of this one as a result, which is the, the green one, uh, which is exa exactly what I did um, here, because I don't intuitively just know um, <laughs> which order we need to have these two in. Um, if you flip the order, if you have this one, and you take these two vectors, um, and you flip them so that they are in the other direction, uh, the, this one is going to point in the opposite direction. Um, so depending on what, um, which order you pass these in, the result is going to point in different directions. Um, so the, in the cross product case, unlike the dot product, uh, the order in which you, uh, in the order in which you pass the vectors in matter, um, because you're going to get things pointing in different directions. Um, yeah. So that's how it works. What dictates if the green vector is on the right or the red vector compared to the left? Uh, so that is the handedness of the coordinate system that you're working in. Um, the, the cross product is sort of what defines the handedness of your coordinate system. The way you implement cross product is your handedness. So, so quite often you can sometimes have these issues where like you're trying to figure out some orientation of something, but it keeps being wrong because it keeps flipping. And then you kind of realize that, well, um, you need to define an, a handedness in order to uh, know uh, to have a consistent coordinate system. Um, so I also an animation for this. Here's a pro tip. If you search for Freya Holmer, Twitter, and then insert any math concept, uh, so if I, I say cross product, then you will you will find a tweet generally. Uh, so here is a visualization of the cross product. Um, so it is an animated version. Uh, so you have the uh, this is the x or not x axis I guess the red axis uh, crossed by the green axis gives you the blue one right here. So as you can see, as they squeeze together, uh, the length of the resulting vector of the cross product in this case c uh, shrinks, right? Uh, and if they flip direction, the c is going to point in the other direction too. So that's how it works. And if you are uh, if you don't have these like 3D printed gizmos or whatever, 
uh, then here's the tip. Um, there, in mathematics, there is a thing called the right-hand rule, and in physics. Um, forget about that. In Unity, we have the left-hand rule. Uh, so in Unity, uh, Unity is a left-handed coordinate system with a Y up. So you can use your literal left hand to figure out how this works. Uh, so you can just go in order of your fingers, uh, X, Y, Z, and you can sort of position your fingers like this. Uh, so this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, that's the z-axis. Uh, so you sort of have something resembling a gizmo. So this is really useful because now you know that the cross product between this vector and this vector is that vector. Uh, so that's a way of like kind of visualizing things and trying to figure out um, you know, what would result in what given your input data. Um, it's also a pretty cool gang sign. So if you're left-hand crew or right-hand crew, you can, you can do your gizmos, you know? Um, Anyway, but both Unreal and Unity is left-handed, so I don't know what that would be, like Blender or Maya or something. Uh, Source Engine is right-handed. Um, but yeah, so, so that's a very useful concept. Uh, in addition to that, because Unity is a left-handed system, whenever you rotate something, you can also use your left hand to figure out what is a positive rotation around an axis. So if you hold your hand like this, sort of like a thumbs up, um, your thumb is the axis, and the directions that your fingers are curling is a positive rotation. If you imagine your fingers being an arrow, kind of curling around your thumb. So your thumb is essentially the axis, and this is a positive rotation. Um, which is really useful, because it's kind of annoying to like try it, and then it goes the wrong direction, and then you have to like change it, and then recompile, and then try it again. So it's a, it's, it's usually, it's very, it's a very handy tool. G get it? Uh, anyway, left hand rule, uh, useful. Uh, use your left hands. They're great. Uh, how does cross product work mathematically? I have never memorized that one. Um, let's let's just let's just look it up. Like this. There you go. Here's a bunch of symbols. Um, this looks like it's necessarily convoluted though. Uh, it's a bunch of matrix shenanigans. Um, there you go. Go to go to Wikipedia <laughs> for that. Um, I've never had to write a cross product function myself. This is a right hand rule, and they're not even using the thumb and index finger. That's gross. Uh, right handed is standard in math. Left handed is standard in Unity. Because everything is inconsistent and it's chaos. Okay, so there's one more. Uh, there's one more useful concept in. Um, how the cross product works. Uh, I guess we could do an example of something, but it requires a bunch of setup, which might be a little annoying. Anyway, uh, we could do that if you want, but we're kind of running low on time and I would like to go through trigonometry before we end the stream today. Can you give another use case for the cross product? Um, the thing is, it's kind of hard to, um, hard to give one. Um, oh yeah, triangles in a mesh is a pretty good example. Um, <clears throat> Although this is a little esoteric as well, but if you are making a mesh in, in Unity or in any other application, uh, you generally have vertices, right? And each triangle is a set of three vertices and edges. If you have this normal in mesh data, uh, then uh, generally there's a... Um, there is a like a fixed way that the cross product, uh, or where you can use the cross product in order to figure out what's the normal of this surface, uh, because the um, the mesh data itself does not contain uh, which side of this face is pointing up versus pointing down. Like, is this the back face or the front face? Uh, the way that this works is implicitly uh, depending on what order the vertices are defined in. So, if this is vertex zero and this is one, and this is two, uh, then you can use the cross product. So if you do the cross product between this vector and this vector, uh, again, remember what the cross product does. No matter what vectors we give it, it's going to return a vector that is perpendicular to both. Um, so uh, and that's exactly what we want, right? Uh, sorry, you just need to correct the planar, the handles. There we go. 
Okay, so they're going to be uh, orthogonal to each other, or rather um, the output vector is going to be orthogonal to both of the input vectors. So if we uh, give this vector, um, actually, why did I not draw this one in green? And that's not green. I'm messing up. I'm sorry. So if we pass these two into a cross product, the result of that is going to be a vector that is pointing in this direction. I'm pretty sure. Let me double check. Uh, no, it's actually not. I guess it, you would flip one of them in the other direction. Um, anyway, the point is the cross product uh, and the winding order is what defines the normal of a uh, of a triangle. Uh, so. In this case, we can, instead of doing this vector, I think it might use these two vectors instead. Um, but if the winding order goes in this direction in a triangle, it's called winding order, which is the, the order in which we define the vertices. Um, again, we can use the left hand rule, like use your hand. The curling of your fingers is the winding order and the thumb is the normal. Um, and that way we can then figure out that this is the normal uh, of that surface. So, so, so face normals are implicitly defined by the order that uh, vertices are defined in meshes. Another use case for the cross product. This is a little difficult to do without having like a um, an actual game to do this in. And it's kind of annoying to do this, but you know what? I'm learning how to draw, so here we go. Look at this 3D terrain. Isn't this beautiful? And then goes off into the distance somewhere. Wow. Let's say, I don't know if you played a lot of uh, Overwatch or like Team Fortress 2, um, but usually you have, uh, in these types of games, you have someone who can place a turret, right? You have uh, Engineer in TF2 and Torbjorn in, um, in Overwatch. So, so let's say you want to place a turret and your game features uneven terrain. Um, how do you figure out the rotation of the turret? So, okay, so we might think about, um, so maybe you're standing somewhere, uh, somewhere here, uh, and you want to place the turret. Uh, so let's say you want to place it here. Uh, so what is the orientation of this turret now? Well, all right, for starters, um, you point to the terrain. So we have a normal, so that's a good start, right? Uh, so now we know that uh, we have a normal vector, which maybe we can use that as the up vector for the turret, right? Um, but what about the other vectors? Like, how do, how do we define the other ones? Uh, there's an infinite number of possibilities for where the other vectors could point, right? Uh, so currently we just have a normal, and that's not enough to define a full rotation. Uh, so while this will say uh, what's going to be the up vector of the turret, it doesn't say what the forward vector is going to be. So then you're like, okay, but well, maybe we can use the direction that the player is looking, um, but the player could be looking like almost downwards, right? Uh, so if we do a side view, you know, maybe the player is looking down like that, and then you have the terrain, um, bad example. Uh, then you have the terrain, and the terrain has a normal, and then you have the uh, look direction of the player, and then you might wonder, like, okay, so we have the look vector of the player, but that is not orthogonal to uh, to this one, right? Um, <clears throat> so what you can then do, if you do the cross product between these two vectors, um, again, you will get a vector that is perpendicular to both. This is, like, so, so, so crucial. Um, so let's say the player is looking towards the, the point where they're going to place a turret. Um, and then you use the cross product. You use the cross product to figure out another axis. Uh, so now you will get one that is pointing to the uh, right or left. I guess I'm, I'm going to ignore handedness now because I just want to do this quickly. Um, so, so now you have another vector that should be a little thicker for clarity. Um, so now you have the right axis here. Um, and now that we have these two, all we need to do to get the, the last vector is do the cross product between these two. Uh, and after that, um, we now have a uh, full rotation, right? Uh, and now we know how, what orientation to place the turret in. Um, that's another use case. Um, <clears throat> so, and if you want some terminology for this, um, 
this is sort of, because we did this as well as creating an, an x-axis um, and sort of flattening this one to go along the terrain. Um, this is called orthonormalization. <laughs> so there, there are like built-in functions in various places uh, where you can do this type of thing. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so that's that's a useful thing. Cross product is orthogonal to both input vectors. Yes, the result of the cross product is always orthogonal to the input vectors, uh, unless the input vectors are zero vectors. In that case, uh, or if they are, um, actually, if the input vectors are parallel, uh, then the output vector is always going to be uh, is also going to be a zero vector. Uh, so the cross product between uh, this vector and one pointing in the exact opposite direction is going to be a zero vector because uh, the problem is that if these are pointing in the exact same direction, uh, there's an infinite number of solutions around this, right? Uh, it could point in any of these directions. Um, th there is no one solution for where a uh, perpendicular one would point because all of them would be perpendicular. Um, so that's why there's a degenerate case of vectors pointing in the either uh, vectors being entirely parallel. Uh, whether or not they're pointing in the same direction. Uh, so that's a degenerate case of the cross product. Basically, you're defining a plane in space and getting its normal? Yes. Um, okay, anyway, I was going to like do this in Unity, but it takes a while to like set up a terrain that's useful enough to, I don't know. Um, here's another neat use case of the cross product. If you do the cross product between, let's call this A, let's call this one B, they're not fully aligned, but you know what? That's okay. Um, so you have vectors A and B. If you do the cross product between these two, as in A cross B, um, like I mentioned before, this is going to return a vector that is perpendicular to both of these. Uh, let me check the left hand rule. Uh, yes, it would point in this direction. Um, so because again, it's orthogonal, it's orthogonal to both of these vectors. But there's another property of the cross product uh, where if you look at the length of this vector, uh, which again, if we use the notation we used before of vector length, if you take the length of this vector, what you're going to end up with is you're going to get the area of the parallelogram that these two form in this region right here. Uh, so the length of this one um, actually represents the area of this plane right here. Uh, so if you, for instance, want to use know the area of this triangle, well, all you need to do is you can take this and divide it by two because you split the parallelogram exactly in half. So you can get the area of a triangle using the cross product, uh, only supplying these two vectors A and B. Uh, so that way you don't have to deal with trigonometry or any of that garbage. You can just, you can just pass those vectors in. Uh, if you just take a sort of downwards facing vector, cross multiply by the normal, you get the red vector parallel to the surface. Yes. Uh, is it just that the red vector is shorter if the blue vector is facing a bit downwards? Uh, yes. So um, like I mentioned before, um, if these are perpendicular, like exactly perpendicular, if A and B is perpendicular, uh, C is going to have a length of one, assuming they're all normalized. Uh, but if they start going close to each other, it's going to be shorter. Um, so quite often when you're doing these things, you, um, if you, if you don't know that they are, um, if you don't know that they're orthogonal, then you always need to normalize it, but, uh, it gets you the correct direction, even though it's not normalized. Uh, so you would do the cross product, normalize it. Um, and then you, uh, then you can use those two vectors that were then found, uh, the blue and the red one, do the cross product between those two, and you end up getting the last axis of this one. And now you know the full orientation of this object, right? So incidentally, uh, Unity has a function called look rotation, um, and look rotation has a built-in reference vector. Um, so look rotation presumes that it's going to use the world up vector as a reference unless you supply a different vector. So this is why uh, if you if you do look rotation with some character and you're looking like in that direction, uh, what Unity is going to do internally is that implicitly it's going to use the world space up vector to figure out the full rotation that you want for the camera here, right? So it's going to do the cross product. Uh, it's going to figure out, you know, what you want the up vector to be, what you want the forward vector to be, and what the right vector is going to be. Um, so, so internally, Unity is using the up vector here. Uh, because again, if you think about it, quite often when you're, you're defining a rotation, it's really important to remember that a single vector 
can never define a full rotation. A single vector is not capable of doing that. Uh, because if, if you think about how vector, what information vectors contain, they don't contain what rotation you're going to have around that axis. Um, so you can never ever fully define a rotation using only a vector. So that's why Unity, when you do look rotation, it presumes that you want the role of the camera to be aligned so that it aligns with the world up. Uh, so that's what it presumes. You can, of course, apply your own up vector. Um, but yeah, so if you want to do your own stuff and you want to align it to something else, you would supply your own uh, rotation there. Incidentally, this is also a very uh, useful way of constructing quaternions. Um, there is something called a quaternion dot look rotation, uh, where all you give it is a forward vector and an up vector, and then it, just can, it can just do the last one manually because it's always the same vector. Okay, uh, cross product thing. What are we going to do? Let's use Androgismus. Um, So, okay, we want to, let's see, um, so I guess the easiest thing we can do is just use this to raycast into the scene. Um, so I guess let's give this some sort of new, so we can see what's happening. Okay, so let's see, uh, we want to raycast. So if physics.raycast, um, let's use transform.position, transform.forward, um, and out. Uh, Raycast. Hit. Hit. There we go. Okay, cool. So we're recasting the scene, and I guess for now we can just draw a line. So um, I guess we need the position. So hit position. Um. Oh, here's a hot tip, by the way. Handles dot draw a a polyline is anti-aliased. So if you want to do like a little bit prettier lines, you can use draw a polyline. So we want to draw it from the position to. Actually, I feel like we should make a variable out of this because um, I want to call this head position. Just to clarify that this is the head of the player, right? Okay, draw it from the head to the hip position, and let's go back. What a beautiful raycast! Isn't that neat? Okay, just for... I kind of want a line at all times, even if it misses, so... So we're gonna, we're gonna do another line from head position to head position uh, plus look direction, which is gonna be transform... Eh. Transform to forward. Um... so used to using my uh, using shapes. <laughs> I keep typing draw, but that's not how it works. Um, okay, there we go. So now we can see if it misses at least. So that's good. Um, it's a little difficult to see on this one, so I'm gonna turn down the lights a little bit. It's a little intense. Why not use shapes? Uh, because if you go, hey, can you send me the code? It's not going to work unless you own shapes. Um, okay, so... All right, so now we've just got the basic setup here. Um, so remember that the, the goal was that we... Uh, this red dot is Torbjorn and we want to place a turret, right? Uh, and we need to figure out what is the orientation of this turret that we want to place there. Uh, and like I mentioned before, kind of the, the first go-to for this um, is the uh, normal of the surface. Um, so, uh, so, so let's visualize that. Let's visualize the normal. Uh, so let's set handles color to uh, blue. And let's draw another line. Um, actually... Mm -mm. Sorry, I'm just refactoring because it looked like garbage and I don't want to copy my code around too much. There we go. Um, 
because we're going to draw a bunch of normal isometers, so why not? Um, okay, normal of the surface. So the normal of the surface, uh, in this case, uh, we're just going to do... Um, it's just a hit normal, right? It's hit dot normal. Uh, so that's already supplied by the raycast data. Uh, so we got the normal right there. And so if we go back here just to verify that we got the uh, uh, blue line. We're drawing it in the wrong location. And that's because we should draw it at hit position and not at the player. Um, there we go. That blue line is kind of faint. So we're going to go with cyan instead. Uh, cool. So now we have the normal of the surface. We are recasting against it, and we can see that this very much looks like the normal. It is orthogonal to the surface it's hitting, right? So now we, we're like sort of there because we now know that this is probably going to be the up vector uh, of the turret that we want to place on the surface. We know that for sure because we the turret has a flat ground and it has a defined up, so we want to place the turret you know, aligned with the surface. But again, the problem is what direction should it point after it's been placed on that surface? Uh, because we can't simply make it point the same way the player is looking, because the player is looking like down into the ground, or they could be looking in any direction, right? Um, very likely the player is not going to look in a, a direction that is aligned with the surface, or like orthogonal to the tangent, um, or normal, sorry. Anyway, so we need to solve this somehow. Uh, so again, the kind of the first step is to do the cross products um, of these two. Uh, so so let's do that. So actually, let's uh, save the normal over here. Um, if the player manually set the turret rotation, though, this would be enough, right? Um, not really, because what is the default rotation? If you don't have a default rotation, then they're pretty much going to like flicker around because you're just presuming a bunch of things. Um, so if you were to use something like Unity's um, look rotation, then depending on what part of this one you're placing it, the turret would face downhill. That would be the that would be the kind of kind of the default of this. Yeah, so so you need to, it really depends on like the situation, right? But you probably want a default rotation, even though the player can set it manually, right? So so now we got the hit position, we got the normal, and that's just supplied by the raycast. Um, okay, actually, let's draw these in the colors that we're going to use for the axes of the turret. Um, so I'm going to swap around the colors a bit. Um, so so this is going to be, be the up vector, so let's make it green. So let's go, let's call it up instead of normal, because now we're going to start defining the orientation of the turret. Uh, there we go. Okay, so we got the up vector. Cool. Um, well, what is the, the vector pointing to the right? That is kind of the first one that we can get from this. Um, so we can go back here and vector three, right. Um, and then we want to uh, do the cross product between the direction that the player is looking and the up vector of the, um, or, or the normal of the surface, which is the up vector in this case. So we can do vector three dot um, cross, uh, and then we can pass in the up vector and the look direction. Uh, let's see, which ones do we want to pass in? Um, I'm using my gizmos now again. Player direction and up direction. So we want to do look direction and up. Cool. So now we have the right vector. So then we should draw that. So let's do another one. Uh, color. Uh, this one should be uh, red. Was there a rule? Yes. Left hand rule. Use your left hand. Um, A cross B equals C. Um, that's it. X-axis crossed with the Y-axis gives you the Z-axis. Also, no, I made these myself, uh, so there's no place to buy them unless I do something about it, because a lot of people are asking me about them. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, so now we should be able to draw this one. So from hit position to right. So let's go back to Unity. Uh, and now it's probably going to have the incorrect length. Oh, wait, I was thinking reverse about this one because it's not the... I was thinking in shader terms, in which case look direction is usually going in the other direction. Um, but you know what? 
we can just flip these back and everything's going to be fine. There we go. Okay, so now we have an, something that is pointing to the right um, in this orientation. Uh, however, it is not um, it is not normalized. This one is shorter than the green line, right? Uh, so we want to make sure that this one has the same length. Um, and again, we can just normalize that. So dot normalized, go back to Unity, recompile, and now it's normalized. Uh, so now we have two orthogonal vectors. Um, and the third one now is trivial to calculate, because now, now we can just do the cross product between those two. Uh, so let's see. Uh, we have, trying to be open about my thinking process, uh, up vector. Um, and we have the right vector, and we want to get the forward vector. Uh, in that case, uh, it's just straightforward, right? That just matches perfectly. Uh, so we don't need to do any complicated stuff. It's always just right cross up gives you forward. And these two are normalized. So and they're normalized and orthogonal already. So we don't need to normalize the results of this cross product. Um, so let's call this one forward uh, vector three dot cross um, right up. And that gives us the forward vector. Uh, so let's draw the forward vector. So color dot um, cyan. And forward. And let's go back to Unity. And now we have a full orientation. So now if you rotate this one, uh, you can see that the turret is sort of uh, presuming that you want the turret to look away from the player in terms of its forward direction. But that is very likely what the player wants it to do, right? Because intuitively, if you are looking down towards the ground and you're placing a turret, you probably want it to point kind of forward in the same direction as you're looking, right? Uh, so that's why we're looking, we're using the player look direction as a reference to figure out the orientation of the turret that we're placing. Um, yeah. When you did the cross product for the right vector, you kind of the play direction as right and normal as up. Um, well, what is right and what is up is kind of just an interpretation thing. Um, it's more so that it follows the left-handed rule, right? Well, the left-hand rule uh, of this one cross this one gives you this direction. Um, so that's kind of a better way of thinking about it. But yeah, they just happen to align with the x and y axes for the last uh, one we did. Yeah. Um, was that clear? Uh, do you, was there anything? Any questions about this? I apologize for the very thin lines. What if you do the opposite? Do you get a vector pointing in the exact opposite direction? If you swap the arguments of a cross product, the output reverses. Yes, it points in the opposite direction. Unity Z is away from camera. Yes. Is there a stroke width for polyline? I th think so, but you need to supply your own texture. Um, and I think it looks pretty garbage. Uh, let's see if I can remember this. Yes, there you go. Let's make them five pixels wide. I don't know if it's meters or pixels. Uh, there you go. Uh, cross up right equals forward, cross right forward equals up, cross forward up equals right. Uh, I would have to double check, but if you've double checked it with the left hand rule, then I presume you're correct, yeah? Oh, someone asked about the visualizations. So I'll just post them in. Here's the area thing where you can get the area of a, of a parallelogram or the area of a triangle using the cross product. You know, I thought we would cover trigonometry, but we are very close to the end. How's that area thing work? I thought a cross product would return a vector. Yes, you get the length of the result of the cross product. Oh gosh, this is harder than the one before. All of my assignment ideas involve trigonometry. No, not sure. Did we actually do anything with matrices or did you just tell us they exist? Um, we didn't really directly use them, but we did indirectly use them because we um, because we were using the transform functions. So I just mentioned that that is what Unity is doing internally. But I mean, I could show how to use them directly um, if you want to. Each pixel has a normal that is in tangent space, with space which is relative to the mesh's main normal. Uh, it's relative to the tangent space that the mesh data contains, yes. Uh, mesh data generally contains um, the normals, uh, per vertex normals, and per vertex tangents. And then you can construct um, the bitangent using the cross product, and then you have tangent space, right? Anyway, I think that's it. Also, like the left side is kind of from the last the whole thing, so I need to figure out some assignments. This is hard. I might need some time to figure these out. Um, so I think I'm probably going to end the stream uh, and figure them out after all of this. We shall talk about trigonometry next week then.
Thank you all so much for joining. I hope this was useful or good or neat or interesting or otherwise entertaining. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's that's going to be it.